Item number, SCP-482. Object class, Euclid. Special containment procedures. SCP-482 was recovered during an experiment being conducted by Dr. Bright. After initial containment, SCP-482 was turned over to Dr. for documentation and analysis. Dr. Bright and Dr. are to be notified immediately should there be any changes to SCP-482 or any duplicates found. While it is not being tested, SCP-482 is to be stored in containment locker located at site. Access to the locker is restricted to level 2 personnel and above. Such access, and all activities thereafter, are to be logged and recorded within 24 hours of completion. The maximum time limit for testing of SCP-482 is one hour after mutations manifest. All subjects who have reached or exceeded this point while in contact with SCP-482 are to be immediately terminated. Before autopsy and disposal, SCP-482 is to be recovered first and separated from the subject's body. Localized thermal cleansing protocol is then to be performed on the body after autopsy, and any biological samples or personnel deemed contaminated by the test subject. Description SCP-482 is a black leather straitjacket of similar make to the brand. Although the jacket seems to be made for the medium size, testing has shown that it can fit most body sizes. Subjects with larger body types report, however, that they feel compressed or suffocated while wearing it. The words Main in Saoyan, China, Hand Wash Only, No Asa Regina Powder, are present on the manufacturer's tag in faded text. Neither the factory nor the item as a Regina exist on any known records. Finally, while there are no obvious signs of wear and tear on the item, there are several small cuts on the straps. Analysis has shown that these could not have been inflicted by anyone wearing SCP-482. Testing has shown that while immune to any damage due to body changes occurred by the subject, it can be damaged by external forces, as normal for an object of this material. Further destructive testing on SCP-482 has been suspended due to the lack of viable duplicates. SCP-482 has two known effects, occurring in a linear fashion once the item is worn. These have been identified as Time Points Alpha and Beta. Experiments have shown that while the effects of Time Point Alpha fade after loss of contact with SCP-482, those inflicted by Beta are permanent. Time Point Alpha refers to the initial stage of exposure to SCP-482. This exposure time lasts a varied period between 1 and 6 hours that a subject wears SCP-482. The item can be removed before Alpha elapses completely without ill effect. During this period, the subject feels mentally better. Any mental afflictions that the subject possesses, regardless of degree or intensity, are negated completely. Any medication being taken by the subject has its effects completely negated as well. Foundation standard psychological tests return results consistent with a baseline normal, mentally stable individual. Upon separation of the subject in SCP-482, the mental illnesses return in full force, along with the side effects of any medication. Multiple sessions wearing SCP-482 have continued effect though any time in the suit contributes to the overall cumulative time until the subject reaches Time Point Beta. Time Point Beta refers to the subsequent time period that passes if a subject is still wearing SCP-482 once Alpha lapses. During this period, the subject experiences physical mutation that seems to be determined by the nature of the subject's mental disorder. Should the subject have multiple mental illnesses, the mutations will manifest according to their degree of strength. See Experiment Log SCP-482 for recorded physical mutations observed during testing. Experiment Log SCP-482 Known mutations created by SCP-482 are listed in the document as follows. Test Number 1 Subject Gender Male Subject's known mental illness Schizophrenia Medication None. Exposure. Alpha. Subject reported being eerily calm. 
subject was noted as simply sitting and looking at the walls with a blank expression. No other effects for 2 hours 49 minutes of exposure. Exposure. Beta. At 2 hours 50 minutes, subject's body started to contort in random directions, while he stated that he was experiencing great pain. The subject's skull increased in mass and size, though the suit continued to confine the patient. Subject's body began to increase dramatically in mass, although body growth was not symmetrical. Observers noticed the subject's mouth and eyes began to bulge and deform beneath the mask of the suit. Subject then slammed his body against the testing cage, screaming incoherently while attempting to make eye contact with as many observers as possible. Termination order was executed at 34 minutes after time point beta was reached. Notes Subject's body was determined to have increased in mass by nearly 180% as of termination. Most of the increase was bone and muscle tissue. While no external source has been found to explain this growth, several genetic samples had abnormally shortened telomere strands. Observers also reported an unnatural feeling that precluded normal movement whenever eye contact with the mutated subject was made, suggesting full mimetic security precautions in place for all future testing. Test number two. Subject gender. Male. Subject's known mental illness. Paranoid personality disorder. Medication. Exposure Alpha. Subject reported being, quote, quiet in his head, end quote. Subject was noted as whirling his head around, exclaiming, God damn, this is better than the sh you gave me. I can't hear them anymore. Subject was then removed from SCP-482 after two hours of exposure. Subject then expressed a desire to return to the suit. Subject became increasingly agitated and eventually became violent when his requests were denied. After 30 minutes, Dr. approved the subject's return to the suit. Subject returned to the previously calm state for 1 hour and 30 minutes. Exposure Beta At 3 hours 30 minutes, subject apparently reached point beta. Mutation began manifesting at this point. Visible bulges appeared beneath the surface of the suit around the head, neck, and shoulder area. Since the subject was fully enclosed, it was initially impossible to determine the nature of these bulges. Four minutes after the bulges appeared, subject was heard to exclaim, Stop talking! Get out of my head! Consistent with extreme instances of paranoia, bulges then began to spread down the length of the body as well at 15 minutes after mutations began. At this point, audio recorded at least seven distinct sounds that analysts indicate could be voices speaking an unknown language. Termination order was given at 25 minutes after point beta had been passed. Notes Autopsy indicates that each bulge that manifested beneath the suit was a fully formed mouth, at least 6 millimeters across, with small channels to the lung system and voice boxes, so that the mouths could speak. Future review of tapes shows small shadows appearing and disappearing indistinctly throughout the recording. Researchers questioned about this confirmed that on review of their experience, they remember seeing movement in their peripheral vision, but at the time, were focused on the subject, so did not note the experience. All future tests should have follow-up interviews with researchers 24 hours, 3 days, and 2 weeks after testing, for potential lasting mimetic effects. Dr. Test number 3. Subject Gender. Male. Subject's known mental illness. Satyriasis. Medication. None. Exposure Alpha. Subject reported being, quote, unable to get a boner, end quote. Subject displayed signs of minor lethargy and lack of initiative in performing anything beyond sitting and looking around. Media of sexual nature was displayed to the subject, who expressed lack of interest in them. No other reactions were noted at this time. Initial stage lasted 3 hours 17 minutes. Exposure Beta At 3 hours 18 minutes, subjects started shuddering and began to spasm repeatedly. These reactions started occurring in increasing frequency and duration. At 3 hours 39 minutes, subject began convulsing violently 
and started expelling a white fluid from his mouth, visible to outside observers through the suit's mask. Termination order was given at 3 hours and 45 minutes after initial reactions observed. Notes: The autopsy revealed that the subject's whole body, while physically unchanged outside, had been converted inside into a series of linked organs that allowed the subject to create massive amounts of sperm and release it via existing orifices at a high rate. Initial spasms and convulsions were apparently a series of near-continuous orgasms suffered by the patient. The expelled semen began exiting the body through all major orifices, and the autopsy also shows that channels were forming beneath the subject's skin perhaps eventually leading to expelling of the seminal fluid through the pores as well. It is theorized by researcher M that the severity of the subject's satyriasis may be a factor in its mutation rate. Testing on the collected seminal fluid indicated that it was completely sterile. Observers reported during post-observation interviews that they have become aroused more easily than normal. This effect appears to have worn off after days. The suit does appear to be immune to any physical changes caused to the subject. But anything expelled from the subject does not magically disappear, people. With results like these, the suit should be fully cleaned and sterilized after every use. Dr. Test number four. Subject gender. Female. Subject's known mental illness. Hyperphagia. Medication. Exposure alpha. Subject was offered a full seven course meal with feeding assistance from researchers. Subject refused the offer, stating that, for the first time ever, I'm actually full. Subject conversed about various topics with researchers and otherwise ignored offers for food. No other reactions were noted for 1 hour 58 minutes. Exposure Beta At 1 hour 59 minutes after initial exposure, subject indicated a dull pain in her midsection, centering around her stomach. Pain intensity began to increase as the experiment continued. The subject's extremities apparently began to retract into her body, though the suit continued to conform to her new body's shape. Subject curled up in a fetal position, stating that she was in intense pain, and saying, Oh God, it's eating me. Oh God, it hurts. Limbs began to retract inward with a loud snapping sound at 15 minutes past manifestation of symptoms. Whereupon Dr. issued the termination order. Notes: The autopsy indicates that a separate fully functional digestive system had formed in the subject's body and began consuming the subject's body mass. This system seemed to utilize the subject's own flesh, bone, and fluids to add to its own mass. Dr. theorizes that left unchecked, this organ structure would have potentially consumed the subject's entire body mass. Following this test, observers reported being unable to satisfy hunger cravings with normal volumes of food. Researchers M and R proceeded to consume several kilograms of food from the Foundation cafeteria before security stopped them. These urges faded days after exposure. Test number five. Subject gender, male. Subject's known mental illness, Capgras syndrome. Medication. Exposure Alpha Due to violent behavior, subject was tranquilized prior to the experiment. Subject returned to full consciousness at 17 minutes after donning SCP-482, whereupon he began to rant about a variety of topics that his attending physician noted as the basis for his delusions. However, ranting subsided after several minutes, replaced with utter calm. The subject was heard to exclaim, Huh? What's going on? No other reactions were noted for 4 hours 54 minutes. Exposure Beta Upon entering point beta, subject displayed rapid skin and muscular mutation. Subject's eyes began to bulge noticeably, and recording devices showed what appeared to be text scrolling across the subject's eyes. Subject began facing each researcher in turn, and taking exaggerated breaths. Subject struggled against confinement and began to cry out. I knew it. There's no way you're real. You've kept them from me. Their smell isn't right. They must be in hiding. Subject continued to rant for 48 minutes, at which point the termination order was given. Notes: 
Autopsy revealed that the subject's nervous system pathways had increased in size by percent. The subject's tongue showed an increase in taste buds by percent, and new formations in the eyes had developed. The subject's brain had also increased in mass by percent, with a five times greater density of neural transmitters and conductors. Testing on the formations in the subject's eyes indicate that the subject likely had visual acuity that extended into both the ultraviolet and infrared ranges. Dr. postulates that the increase in sensory information and nerve clusters allowed the subject to test every possible type of input to try and prove that individuals were real and not imposters. Testing is proceeding on extracted nerve sections to determine if we can duplicate their growth and increased density as a basis for potential transplant. After testing, observers indicated a heightened sense of hearing and perception for days, accompanied by an increased sense of paranoia. Test number six. Subject gender, male. Subject's known mental illness, pyromania. Medication, none. Exposure alpha, data expunged. Subject ignored flammable materials offered by researchers for 1 hour 32 minutes. Exposure Beta At 1 hour 33 minutes, testing instruments recorded an increase in ambient room temperature to data expunged. Suffered containment failure at data expunged. Recorded temperatures upwards of Kelvin and spontaneously ignited data expunged. Loss of all observers and caused catastrophic damage to hallway A13 at site before containment was re-established. The suit was recovered unharmed. Notes: The subject's body recovered showed increased density and had magnetic properties that made autopsy difficult. It also retained heat upwards of Kelvin. Dissection showed a new organ in the body that was sustaining a data expunged and appeared stable. The organ was removed and placed in storage in magnetic containment at site for future analysis. Despite the loss of resources and personnel due to this experiment, something productive came from it. If we can figure out how this organ is still containing, then we may open a new avenue of research. Dr. Item Number SCP-400 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures The single colony of SCP-400 in Foundation custody, designation SCP-400-B, is currently housed in a juvenile humanoid containment cell at Site-77's Euclid Objects Wing. Any cell containing an active SCP-400 colony must be secured with an airlock door under Biosafety Level 4 precautions. Any openings for ventilation must be covered by a metal screen with gaps no greater than 0.2 centimeters in diameter, followed by aerosol filter 400 AF to be changed monthly and remanded to on-site chemical research personnel with level 3 slash 400 clearance. Access for experimentation purposes requires approval from both the Ethics Committee and the Items Acting HMCL Supervisor, currently Dr. Marshall Grant. SCP-400 handlers are required to wear level 4 positive pressure biohazard suits and must be decontaminated prior to egress. In emergency situations, prevention of olfactory contact with SCP-400 is sufficient to prevent accidental exposure in most cases. For caregiving instructions, please refer to document 400C Rev 1.3. Agents operating in the continental United States are to report any statistically significant drop in daycare, preschool, and primary school enrollment in their assigned region. Elements of MTF Beta 7, Maz Hatters, are to remain on call for identification, research, and termination of active SCP-400 infestations. Locations found to be infested are to be quarantined using cover story 139B, Bubonic Plague. Media inquiries are to be categorically denied, and all agents of the press demonstrating interest in the quarantine are to be detained and administered a Class B amnestic prior to release. Foundation personnel affected by SCP-400 are subject to quarantine of up to three weeks. If by this time anomalous effects have subsided, personnel are subject to psychological evaluation prior to return to duty. If anomalous effects are still present after the administration of a Class A amnestic, Remaining personnel may be reassigned to non-anomalous research 
administrative, and medical positions. Civilians exposed are to be administered a Class A amnestic prior to release. Please refer to Document 401-R for reintegration instructions by geographic region. Damage control for infestations affecting population centers of 500 persons or more may employ amnestic agent NUE-2 locally, if necessary. At least one active SCP-400 colony must be collected from all subsequent infestations and remanded to genetic research personnel with Level 3-400 clearance. Description SCP-400 is the collective designation for an anomalous species of arthropod, similar to Armadillidium vulgare, or the common pill bug. SCP-400 individuals are morphologically similar to A. vulgare in appearance, but can be distinguished visually by bright red striping patterns on their dorsal carapace. Visual identification is only possible by individuals not under the influence of SCP-400's anomalous effects. SCP-400 is a parasitic organism, which feeds on human mammary secretions. Access to this food source is gained by habitation and manipulation of deceased human infants. Affected persons are subject to a Type 3 cognitohazard via a pheromone vector, which repurposes the natural child-rearing instincts present in all humans for its own feeding and protection. Those subject to this effect are unable to perceive SCP-400 or the damage it causes to infants. Exposure to D-Class assets has determined that the effect does not apply to video or audio surveillance, and that Level 4 biohazard precautions are sufficient in preventing the effect's onset. Personnel briefed on SCP-400's effects show no special immunity to the false perceptions created by the anomaly. As of 1407-2005, the Ethics Committee has determined that future human experimentation with SCP-400 will only be allowed in unique and dire circumstances. As such, all information regarding SCP-400's relationship with humans and life cycle have been compiled from extensive surveillance and interviews conducted in the site of SCP-400's discovery. Conclusions are based on an observational period from August 2003 through July 2005. Infestation begins when 25 to 50 instances of SCP-400 select an infant and access its crib. Precise criteria for this selection is unknown. In the seven colonies observed from inception, infant targets were between three weeks and two months of age. Upper and lower age bounds for infestation have not been established. Observation has failed to detect any instance of SCP-400 prior to appearance within the target crib. Parents and D-Class personnel present will be unable to perceive SCP-400. If any person passes within 0.5 meters of the infant, SCP-400 instances will collectively release a fine spray, which causes immediate disorientation and rapid loss of consciousness. SCP-400 will then begin to burrow into the flesh of the sleeping infant. Favored points of entry include the mouth, eyes, anus, navel, and armpits. The infant will not react to the presence of SCP-400 in any fashion, suggesting the use of local anesthetics. Cardiopulmonary activity in the infant will cease within the first 40 minutes of this procedure, and within three to five hours, movement will resume, followed by strained vocalizations. At this point, the infant is considered an active colony of SCP-400. Incapacitated subjects will awaken soon after the first vocalization and investigate. Parents or other adults present with an earshot will also show interest as per normal for distressed infant vocalization. If the original mother of the colony is present at this time, she will immediately begin breastfeeding, regardless of previous feeding schedule or practices. Over roughly the next 10 weeks, parents and other adults begin to show increased affection and protectiveness toward the colony. During this stage, direct observation by present adults and children will be unable to detect any abnormalities in the colony's physiology, despite numerous dermal perforations and jerky, unnatural movement. The colony is capable of basic vocalization and is able to emulate feeding, defecation, and play behaviors of normal infants with increasing proficiency. 
Decomposition is still visible via surveillance during this time, culminating in desiccation of the colony's remaining soft tissues. It is presumed that the final desiccation is an adaptation of SCP-400, developed to ensure the colony's continued structural integrity. By the end of the twelfth week, all observed colonies exhibited increased size, such that individual instances of SCP-400 are visible moving under the skin. Such colonies are considered mature, and individual instances will begin reproductive behavior during this period. During feeding, 7 to 12 SCP-400 individuals will exit the colony through one of its dermal perforations and take hold of any exposed portion of the host mother's skin for approximately 10 minutes before returning. Host mothers studied during this time begin to show increased progesterone production as well as heightened levels of human chorionic gonadotropin, indicating an induced pregnancy. After an incubation period of two to three days, host mothers will birth 25 to 50 instances of SCP-400 during her next sleep. Instances of SCP-400 have not been successfully tracked after birth. Maximum interval of dormancy before SCP-400 must initiate another infestation is unknown. After breeding behavior begins, the cycle will repeat once weekly for the duration of the infestation. No natural limit to SCP-400 infestation timeline has been observed. Of recorded infestations to date, all have occurred in the southeastern United States, in rural or mountainous areas, and in some cases, have gone unnoticed for as long as nine months. Improved detection and extermination of SCP-400 instances is considered a high research priority. Addendum 401 Interview 425 Forward 25th in a series of interviews conducted during the infestation of 2003. Mrs. B. Interviewed by Dr. Marshall Grant, Agent Fabian Pertucci observing. Mrs. B has served as host mother to SCP-400-A and SCP-400-B simultaneously. The advanced state of decomposition suggests the colonies have been active for over two years. She and her deceased twins are considered strong candidates for patient SCP-400-0. At the time of interview, Mrs. B was isolated from SCP-400 for 15 days. Interview conducted on 10-7-2005. Dr. Grant. Good afternoon. How are we feeling today? Mrs. B. Where are my babies? What have you done with my babies? Dr. Grant. Your children are being treated for possible bubonic plague exposure, ma'am. They will be returned to you as soon as possible. Mrs. B. Subject strikes table. Oh, that's bullshit. You can't keep them from me. You have no right to keep a mother from her children. Tell me where they are or so help me when my husband's lawyers hear of this. Dr. Grant. Mrs. B. We're on your side here. We want to help. If you'll just answer a few questions for me, we'll do everything we can to let you see them this afternoon. Mrs. B. I've already told you on the form. They're three months old. Male. Names expunged. Identical twins. Weigh about 10 pounds. They don't have any allergies. What more do you want from me? Dr. Grant. You said three months old? When were they born? Mrs. B. February 5th, 2003. Now will you- I'm sorry. I'm just- I love them so much. Never thought I would be much of a mother, but they have been such a joy. After my husband died, Subject is silent for 15 seconds. They mean the world to me. I don't know what I would do without them. Not a day goes by, I don't feel blessed. Dr. Grant, I imagine you must. For the record, you're aware of today's date. Mrs. B, it's July the 10th, 2000 f Huh, well that's funny. I could have sworn they were only three months. My, time does fly. I must have a picture of them here somewhere. Subject accesses personal effects and produces a portrait of SCP-400-A and SCP-400-B prior to infestation. Here it is. Aren't they just so beautiful? Dr. Grant. Yes, ma'am. 
Now, has there been anything peculiar about your boys? Mrs. B. Well, there was that time in May when that doctor... No, nothing at all. If anything, they're doing too well. So healthy and full of life. I swear, little... Said Mama just yesterday. Dr. Grant. I'm sorry. What was that about a doctor? Mrs. B. Yes. He came to the house after they... Three second pause. Subject visibly confused. I didn't say anything about a doctor. Let me see my children. Please. They're probably starving by now. They need to be fed. Agent Pertucci. Inaudible to Mrs. B. We're losing her. Come back to it. Dr. Grant. I assure you, ma'am. We're giving them the best care possible. Mrs. B. With that awful formula, I'll bet. Threw up the last time I tried that. Neither of them has touched it since. No. It's natural breast milk for them, 100%. My obstetrician said that they'll need it for at least another three months. And I'm not about to take any risks. Dr. Grant. Isn't two and a half years a little long to be breastfeeding? Mrs. B. They're... They're only three months old. Dr. Grant. But just now, you had said... Mrs. B. I know what I said. It's your fault. Got my head all turned around. Dr. Grant. I'm sorry if I've confused you, ma'am. It's just... Mrs. B. Who the hell are you people anyway? Let me see my babies. At this point in the interview, Mrs. B refused to answer any further questions and exhibited increased emotional distress and separation anxiety. Post-interview medical examination revealed extensive ovarian and uterine trauma in excess of all other host mothers examined. Mrs. B was administered a Class A amnestic when observations were concluded and is currently under Foundation surveillance as a person of interest. Addendum 402 As of 14-7-2010, SCP-400-A and SCP-400-B have been active in Foundation custody for five years, indicating that colonies may be able to survive indefinitely if continually provided with food. Level 4 biohazard precautions have successfully prevented not only reproduction of SCP-400, but also the spread of all cognitohazardous effects within Site-77. Limited access for experimentation may be granted with approval from the Ethics Committee and SCP-400's HMCL supervisor, currently Dr. Grant. Please allow up to 30 days for review prior to beginning any new line of experimentation. Addendum 403 on 5-10-2010, SCP-400-A ceased activity while in containment after ingesting an experimental nutritional supplement, allowing medical examiners to dissect the colony. Despite desiccation and decomposition, muscle tissues remain responsive to electric stimuli. Highest concentrations of SCP-400 can be found in the stomach, mouth, brain case, and spinal column. Of particular note is the presence of individual specimens periodically along major motor nerves in the extremities, indicating an unprecedented level of communal intellect, utilizing the infant's extant neural architecture. Examination of the pheromones produced by individual SCP-400 instances has revealed several hallucinogenic, amnestic, and soporific compounds, which are capable of reproducing SCP-400's cognitohazardous effects. Analysis of several compounds has revealed similarities to Class B and C amnestics currently in use by the Foundation, indicating a possible security breach. Minimal risk. Aerosol concentrations of the mixture as low as 50 ppm have proven effective in initiating the effect. Further research into the genetic sequencing of SCP-400 is recommended. Item Number SCP-414 Object Class Keter. Special Containment Procedures SCP-414 is currently uncontained. Containment efforts focus upon mitigating media attention and providing social work programs to demographics targeted by SCP-414. Individuals affected by SCP-414 iterations must be dosed with Class B amnestics upon discovery and are to be kept under observation. 
Individuals reaching the final stage of SCP-4142 are to be contacted by a Foundation Social Work front company. Individuals under final stage SCP-4142 are to be treated with tri-weekly talk therapy and trained animal companions where applicable. As it is beyond the Foundation's resources to perform surveillance on every possible target of SCP-414, records from social work organizations and mental health care centers are to be trawled for SCP-414 phenomena where possible. Any media reporting of SCP-414 phenomena are to be removed and a cover story provided. A list of applicable cover stories can be found in Document 414-B. A cure for SCP-4142 is to be considered the highest priority after successful and complete containment. Dr. Alice Ogawa, Principal SCP-414 Researcher Description SCP-414 is a phenomenon that targets asocial humans and is categorized into two derivative effects, SCP-4141 and SCP-4142. The asociality may range from minor introversion to complete isolation. SCP-414 primarily affects individuals under the NEAT, not in education, employment, or training demographic, with no regional preference. SCP-414 begins when a humanoid in a circular mask, referred to as SCP-4141, appears in front of a targeted human. SCP-4141 typically claims to be an employee for a local social work organization. SCP-4141 are uniformly tall humanoids, wearing circular masks and clothing that covers the whole body. SCP-4141 only appear when attempting to contact a targeted individual and disappear after successful contact has occurred. SCP-4141 is believed to have a single collective consciousness, capable of sapience, cognizance, and intelligence. SCP-4142 is a chronic degenerative condition, resulting from any successful interaction between a targeted subject and an instance of SCP-4141. Successful interaction occurs when SCP-4141 has a successful face-to-face -face conversation or contact with a targeted subject. A subject that has contracted SCP-4142 undergoes four stages lasting between 2 and 276 days, with a fifth stage believed to be permanent. Individuals who are under 30 years of age, or who received SCP-4142 through physical contact, progress through stages at an accelerated rate. Overview of Document 4142A Symptom Progression Description of SCP-4142 Stage 1 Subject feels increasingly lonely. Coping mechanisms not involving face-to-face -face interaction to distract from loneliness causes an increase of feeling. Subject experiences a loss of pleasure when participating in solitary activities. Stage 1 advances when the subject interacts with another human to alleviate loneliness. Stage 2 Subject experiences a total loss of pleasure when participating in activities not involving in-person interactions with others. Subject begins to have difficulty in recalling events in their life that contributed significantly to their sense of self, but is cognizant of and can recall having such events. Stage 2 advances when the subject interacts with other humans at least once every seven days. Stage 3 Subject is incapable of feeling fulfillment unless interacting with other humans once every five days. They are unable to recall ever enjoying solitary activity or their life before the age of 13. Subject remains cognizant of this inability. Their sense of self is reduced. Stage 3 advances when the subject participates in social events at least once every seven days. Stage 4 Subject is incapable of feeling fulfillment without interacting with other humans once every 45 hours. They are unable to recall having significant relationships lasting more than two years and are cognizant of this inability. Any sense of self is reduced to name, gender, age, and current emotional state. Subject usually becomes highly productive to feel fulfillment, participating in a range of social activities, such as volunteering and hosting gatherings. The circumstances to advance Stage 4 are currently unknown. Stage 5 
This is currently considered the final stage. Subject develops hallucinations and sensations of being physically hollow or empty when not currently participating in social activities, causing them to become upset when not in proximity to another person for any length of time over 15 minutes. They are unable to recall having significant relationships and are cognizant of this inability. At least individuals have been confirmed to have reached stage 5. For a list of confirmed SCP-4142 cases and extensive description, please refer to document 4142A. Notable cases of SCP-4142 are 4142 MacGyver Jacob, the current oldest case, and 414 Kyung Myung, with the shortest recorded interval between diagnosis and suicide of 48 hours. There is no cure or treatment available beyond coping mechanisms. SCP-4142 has a fatality rate of 46.78% over 5 years and 67.84% over 10 years. Individuals over the age of 40 have significantly higher fatality rates of 87.23% over 5 years and 93.85% over 10 years. All fatalities are a result of suicide. 09-12-2014 Incident 414A. At 6.02, Dr. Eliza Chuang, then Principal SCP-414 Research Scientist, was contacted by 3 SCP-4141. Dr. Chuang had a successful conversation, transcribed below. Dr. Chuang was succeeded by their primary assistant, Dr. Alice Ogawa, immediately after Incident 414A. Despite constant social interaction and animal companionship, Dr. Chuang committed suicide on 09 2015 965 days after advancing to Stage 5 SCP-4142. Transcript of Incident 414-A Begin Log 602 Three SCP-4141 humanoids appear at Dr. Chuang's office door. Dr. Chuang can be seen walking to their office. Dr. Chuang stops upon seeing the group of SCP-4141. 603. The group of SCP-4141 move towards Dr. Chuang at a speed of approximately 1 meter per second. One SCP-4141 humanoid grasps Dr. Chuang by the wrist as they attempt to leave. Dr. Chuang begins to struggle and shout for assistance. 604. Security arrives. Dr. Chuang can be seen waving their free arm and shouting, Do not approach! Do not talk! Stand there, please! Security draws weapons and aims at the group of SCP-4141, but do not fire. Dr. Chuang turns back to the group of SCP-4141. 606. Dr. Chuang, calmly. If you wouldn't mind, could you answer a few questions? Why are you doing this? How do you benefit by doing this to people? 608. SCP-4141 in unison. They work so little. They are held up when they need to be the foundation. The young so much so. I will help every one of you. 610. Dr. Chuang. Even when they kill themselves. Even when they forget who they are. How does that help what is your reasoning? 612. SCP-4141 in unison. It is a last usefulness to society to die and leave resources for others. Others make use of them. Forget yourself for your society. You cannot be egotistical when the ego is carved out. Selfishness. I will cure it by excising the tumor. I cure society and make the lost find purpose. I help. 614. Dr. Chuang, agitatedly. But society needs that. They need individuals. Selfishness can drive and motivate success. 615. SCP-4141, recoiling collectively. You are sicker than I thought. You may be kind among your human populace. But I have surely known kinder men. I thought you, who worked for the good of all, 
would be my ally. But it's alright. I will take care of you. You will feel better when I'm done with you. 616. Dr. Chuang, why did you come to me? Who are you? Where are you from? And how do you work? Dr. Chuang can be seen attempting to free themselves from the grip on their arm. 615. SCP-4141, in unison. You want to stop us, but you are trying to stop helping. You are secure, contain, protect. I am society, community, progress. A shepherd for humans. You are a sick lost lamb, not for much longer. 617. Dr. Chuang attempts to speak, but an SCP-4141 instance puts a gloved finger to their lips. The instance pets Dr. Chuang's head and presses its mask against the side of their head, accompanied by a kissing sound. 618. The group of SCP-4141 produces a flash of light, and the camera feed cuts for 0.3 seconds. When the feed is returned, all SCP-4141 instances are missing. Dr. Chuang kneels on the floor, head in hands. End Log Transcript of Interview 41456 Interviewed Dr. Eliza Chuang Interviewer Dr. Alice Ogawa Forward This interview occurs 35 days after Dr. Chuang is confirmed to have entered Stage 5 SCP-4142. Begin Log Dr. Ogawa Good morning, Dr. Chuang. How are you feeling? Dr. Chuang Excitedly Good morning. Your face is so... Ah, it matters little. You are here. It is good to see you. Dr. Ogawa, could you explain what you were about to say regarding my face? Dr. Chuang, calming down. Ah, just, it was so, I once knew a face. I once cared for someone, an assistant. I had an assistant, but I don't remember them. Dr. Ogawa, I see. How do you feel when you remember that you used to remember? Dr. Chuang, it is an unpleasant emotion, definitely. I remember that I used to know and feel so much. I once had a past, but it's gone now. I used to have a project, but that's gone now. It's all gone. But enough about me. What's important to you? Tell me more about yourself. Dr. Ogawa, my research is important to me. It was the life work of my mentor, and now it's become mine. It's what connects me to them. Dr. Chuang, it's good. You have something to believe in. That's necessary. Someone always has to believe in something, with all their being. That's how humanity makes progress. Individuals pursuing what they believe in. Where's your mentor now? Dr. Ogawa, quietly, no longer with me as I understand it. Dr. Chuang, how unfortunate. I'm so sorry. Can I help you? Maybe be your assistant, or keep you company in the laboratories. As I understand, they can get very quiet and lonely. Dr. Ogawa begins to get up. Thank you for the offer, but I think we're done now. Dr. Chuang, wait, please, wait just a moment. Could you at least tell me your name? Dr. Ogawa, leaving, quietly, Alice, just Alice. Dr. Chuang, I'm glad to have known you, Alice. I'm sure this research is stressful for you. I'm sure you've made your mentor proud, and I think that's what an assistant would want, is to succeed their mentor. Dr. Ogawa, whispering. Not as much as I want them back. Thank you for your kind words. Goodbye. Dr. Chuang. Goodbye. Smiling widely, waving. Keep your head high. It'll get better. Have faith. End log. Closing statement. 
Dr. Ogawa no longer performs routine interviews with Dr. Chuang. Routine interviews will be conducted by Dr. K.M. Item Number SCP-405 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Infected subjects are to be contained at SCP-405 isolation zones. These zones exist in depopulated areas. All field teams encountering SCP-405 are to be informed of the locations of nearby isolation zones. All observation of SCP-405 victims is to be done via video link from a distance of no less than one kilometer. If a subject suffering from SCP-405 is in the late stages upon apprehension, they are to be terminated, and all individuals within 200 meters are to undergo treatment protocol 405 Alpha if an isolation area cannot be reached in time. Treatment Protocol 405 Alpha is also to be used on any individuals found in the preliminary stages of SCP-405 infection. SCP-4051 are housed at Research Facility Location Expunged. On no account are individuals suffering from SCP-405 to be brought into contact with SCP-4051. SCP-4051 are to receive limited human contact from doctors and only and only while said doctors have been dosed with Type 3 sedatives. SCP-4051 are housed in adjoining 10 meter by 10 meter by 10 meter cells and are not considered an escape risk. Said research facility's remote location is for their benefit, not ours. Description SCP-405 is a contagious phenomenon of unknown origin that causes the uncontrolled development of telepathic capabilities in humans. The typical progression of the disease is as follows. Primary stage. Zero to two days after exposure. No noticeable effect. Initial stage. Two to seven days after exposure. Subject begins to hear higher order thoughts of nearby subjects, seemingly at random. Thoughts about the subject are most common. Subjects rarely realize that the heard vocalizations are not spoken. Secondary stage. 7 to 10 days after exposure. Subject now hears all conscious thoughts of nearby individuals. Subject will become aware of their telepathic nature. In some subjects, thought projection is first observed here. Subject will usually complain of earache and express a desire for silence. Sleep patterns typically become disrupted due to perceived noise levels. Escalation Stage 10 to 14 days after exposure. Over this period, the range of the subject's abilities increases, typically to about 200 meters, but occasionally far further. In a few rare cases where the subject has pre-existing telepathic capacity, as measured on the mechevik lunton scale, range has been shown to grow exponentially out to several kilometers, leading to the early onset of terminal stage. Subject hears all conscious thoughts of humans within this range, as loudly as if the individuals were speaking directly in the subject's ear. The first suicide attempts typically occur at this point as a result of sleep deprivation and perceived noise levels. Subjects also begin to uncontrollably project their thoughts to nearby individuals. MRI scans taken at this stage indicate several significant deformities in the audio cortex. Plateau Stage 14 to 28 days after exposure no noticeable change in symptoms is evident at first, although many subjects begin to detect unconscious thoughts towards the end of this phase, including automatic responses and reflex actions. Subjects typically exhibit a wide range of dementias, such as consistent with sensory overstimulation and sleep deprivation by this stage, and most attempt suicide, often frequently, and with increasing levels of creativity and desperation. Restrained subjects will typically beg for termination or other extreme measures. One agent at this stage requested being used to examine SCP normally reserved for D-Class personnel. To date, all subjects have been observed to attempt to deafen themselves if able, most commonly by inserting a long thin object, such as a pen, into their ears until the internal structure is destroyed. Towards the end of this phase, subjects often experience catatonic episodes and begin to suffer from seizures. These are apparently not related to the telepathic abilities, 
but rather due to swelling in the subject's neural tissues. Terminal stage. 28 days after exposure until death, typically 32 days after exposure. Subjects slip into a coma and begin to suffer from persistent seizures caused by significant brain deformities. MRI scans taken at this stage confirm audio cortex is still processing vast quantities of data. Experiments with animals, including higher primates, confirm that SCP-405 is species-specific. The vector for SCP-405 is the subject's final mental vocalization, identified by most observers as a death scream. This vocalization occurs at the moment of death, regardless of cause, and has a range of at least 200 meters, although the more advanced the disease, the greater the range. Individuals who hear this telepathic signal are infected with SCP-405. Outbreaks of SCP-405 appear spontaneously. The ultimate cause of these outbreaks is unknown. The earliest believed SCP-405 outbreak was in the town of a famous ghost town. The entire population was recorded to have died either by their own hands or at the hands of deranged residents. Written records are consistent with the symptoms of SCP-405. The cause of SCP-405 outbreaks is unknown, although 79% have been traced to some form of educational facility. Only two cases have occurred outside the continental United States. Sufferers in the primary to early escalation stages of SCP-405 have been successfully treated with Treatment Protocol 405-Alpha. Subjects are administered twice the standard dose of Class D amnestics and placed in a chemically induced coma for three days. This appears to reset brain activity to a pre-infection state and allow abnormal development to subside. Success rate is 1% with greater success in the early stages. No treatment for the later stages exists. For an examination of disease behavior, please see the infected subject interview log. The use of Type 3 disaster synthesis quarantine measures are preemptively approved to contain large-scale SCP-405 outbreaks. To date, only individuals have recovered from SCP-405 naturally. They gained sufficient control of their abilities to deal with small groups of individuals, but are still incapable of dealing with more than individuals at a time without exhibiting extreme stress. Seizures and other neurological conditions caused by structural brain deformities are common. Such individuals are referred to as SCP-4051-A and SCP-4051. They have adopted the designations for themselves and no longer respond to their original identities, perhaps due to the fact that all staff think of them by those designations. The potential value of SCP-4051 to the Foundation is unclear at this time. Addendum 4051 Storing SCP-4051 in the same area was a bad idea. I am sure their personalities are gestalting. I observed SCP-4051 tapping the desk in a room yesterday in a manner consistent with playing the piano, but only SCP-4051 has any musical talent. Worse, SCP-4051 reported finding himself performing an action unconsciously and wished to know if I recognized it. SCP-4051 was unconsciously field stripping an imaginary None of them have military backgrounds. They picked that up from us. If you get any more survivors, don't send them here. Dr. All interviews with SCP-405 victims or SCP-4051 are to be recorded in Interview Log 405. Interview Number 405-141 Interviewed Agent B, diagnosed with terminal Agent has volunteered to act as test subject. Interviewer Dr. Forward First in a series of logs over the stages of an SCP-405 infection. Use of an agent likely to ensure information is delivered as required. Primary stage. Begin log. Doctor. And how are we feeling today? Agent B. Really, Doc? I thought these were meant to be as formal as possible. Anyway, I still feel fine. Apart from the nausea from coming off the drugs. 
Doctor, any strange sensations? Audio hallucinations? Agent B, no, nothing. Doctor, okay, moving on. Agent B, hang on. You, yes, you the D in the corner. Will you stop humming? It's really distracting. Doctor, D isn't humming. Agent B, really, I could have sworn. Oh, f already? End interview segment. Interview number 40545. Interviewed, Agent B. Interviewer, Dr. Forward, initial stage. Begin log. Agent B. No, I am not going to flip out this time. Jeez. Doctor. I haven't said anything yet. Agent B. Sorry. I can't tell the difference. Well, not always. Doctor. Explain. Agent B. Well, I just heard you say explain twice, right? Only one. One, I reckon, is how you... Fuck, sorry. Heard someone. One was how I reckon you must think you sound, less nasally than your real voice. Doctor. Interesting. Agent B. Sorry, I didn't mean... Did you say that or just think it? I think it gets worse the longer I spend with a guy. End interview segment. Interview number 4051421. Interviewed. Agent B. Interviewer. Dr. Original interviewers providing advice via text feed. Forward. Escalation stage. Begin log. Agent B. I feel terrible. I haven't slept in four days, and I wish I had never volunteered for this damn experiment. Doctor. I hadn't... Agent B. I know you f***ing hadn't. I can hear you. I can hear those two brain donors. I can hear even though he's on the other side of the text feed. I can hear every damn person in this damn base. Doctor, calm down. Agent B, you did not just tell me to calm down. How dare you tell me to calm down? I swear, if one more person tells me, or even thinks at me, to be calm, I will wring their f***ing necks. Some of the sick Sick things you guys think. I never knew I worked with such perverts. You know, the guy running this place, he every day. Why am I meatball salad today? This isn't my shut up, shut up. Doctor, we need to discuss your symptoms. Agent B, can I have a pen and paper? I need to write this down. I can't think straight to talk. Pen and paper provided for Agent B. Agent B inserts pen a full inches into his ear. Interview terminated. End interview segment. Interview number 4051429. Interviewed. Agent B. Restrained. Interviewer. Dr. Forward. Late plateau stage. Begin log. Agent B. Get out. Get the hell out. Go away. All of you go away. Dance. Do the maniac dance. Damn we had it coming to her. Help. Shut up. Shut up. Says here that his real name is one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. It's all a cry for help, you know. One day, the world... How do you get it to the lock again? Elizabeth, I miss you, but not that... My head! Get out of my head! And log. Closing statement. The progression of symptoms here is clear. Agent B held out longer than most, but was driven to suicide 22 days after exposure. Agent B managed to pull over his restraint chair and... Item number. SCP-472. Object Class. Euclid. Special Containment Procedures SCP-472 is to be kept in the center of an empty locked cell, measuring 37 meters by 37 meters, or 122 by 122 feet. 
All personnel wishing to enter for research purposes must undergo a psychological evaluation and submit a research request before being permitted entry. Personnel should not remain within 18 meters or 60 feet of the stone for more than five minutes without being directly monitored by security personnel. Update 472-1 No personnel exposed to SCP-472 through Stage 6 of its effects may be allowed more than four consecutive minutes of further exposure without direct approval of Site Command. Update 472-2 once every 60 days, one D-Class personnel must be exposed to SCP-472 for a period of between 10 and 27 minutes. Update 472-3 Due to biomass loss, no personnel may be exposed to SCP-472 more than once in a 48-hour period without explicit approval by Dr. A. Jones. Description SCP-472 is a red garnet of the pyrope spessartite variety of unusual size, 1.8 carat. The phrase, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart, has been engraved in 2 millimeters, 0.08 inches, high lettering on the stone's surface. Relevance of the phrase is unknown. When any organism possessing a heartbeat passes within an 18-meter or 60-foot radius of SCP-472, that subject will begin to hear the distant beating of a heart within their head. The heartbeat heard directly corresponds with the subject's own heartbeat, with the frequency of the palpitations increasing or decreasing with the pulse of the subject. Prolonged exposure causes a variety of additional psychological effects. Stage 1 Onset five to seven minutes. Low-level feelings of unease and anxiety. Effects cease immediately on vacating area. Stage two. Onset, six to 21 minutes. Gradually increasing feelings of anxiety and paranoia. Effects decrease on vacating area and cease within five minutes. Stage three. Onset, 18 to 27 minutes. High-level feelings of anxiety and paranoia. Subject begins to hallucinate, reporting seeing the world around them tinged with red and hearing vague whispering noises. 27% of subjects also report strong feelings of guilt. Effects decrease within 20 minutes of vacating area and cease within 60 minutes. Stage 4 Onset 34 to 59 minutes Previous symptoms increase. Hallucinations become more vivid and visual. Frequent hallucinations include rivulets of blood trailing down the walls, images of dead bodies, thumping, screaming, and ambulatory corpse-like figures. 65% of subjects rendered mentally incapable of leaving the influence of SCP-472. Effects decrease within 60 minutes of vacating area and cease within 3 hours. Stage 5 Onset 55 to 69 minutes Previous symptoms increase 100% of subjects rendered mentally incapable of leaving the influence of SCP-472 38% of subjects exposed enter a state of catatonia This state has a 76% fatality rate if subjects are not removed from SCP-472's area of influence Effects decrease within 6 hours of vacating area and cease within 24 hours. Stage 6 Onset 361 to 723 plus minutes Surviving subjects now capable of leaving the influence of SCP-472, though many do not realize this unless prompted. Previous symptoms vary in degree of intensity and become sporadic alternating with periods of lucidity indefinitely until subject leaves or is removed from the area. Effects cease within 24 hours of vacating area. SCP-472 was recovered from the mansion residence of a wealthy man living in Foundation investigators were alerted by local reports of hauntings by domestic staff after was hospitalized by a fall. Mobile Task Force Delta-5, front runners, was assigned to investigate due to possible connection to ongoing projects. 
Investigation narrowed down the origin of the anomalous effects to SCP-472, which had been prominently displayed in its jewel collection. Origin of SCP-472 is under investigation. SCP-472 was located via reports from the so-called anomalous community, from interfacing with Mobile Task Force Sigma-3, bibliographers. Initial theories from anomalous community sources categorized SCP-472 as a seal, containing an entity responsible for SCP-472's anomalous effects. However, further analysis has not supported this, rather indicating that SCP-472's appearance as a red garnet may be due to a fundamental perception error of unknown nature. Sources have not been able to confirm anything substantial about the origin or nature of SCP-472. Addendum 47245 Effects of Subsequent Exposure Subjects previously exposed to SCP-472's effects experience a cumulative 10-20% increase in the speed of onset of certain SCP-472 effects with each additional exposure. Eventually, subjects will immediately begin experiencing symptoms at Stage 2 levels, with Stage 3 occurring within 5-10 to 10 minutes. Stages 4 to 5 then occur as normal. Time of onset of stage 6 is not affected, and continues to occur no earlier than 361 minutes after initial exposure. Hallucinations begin to differ in nature when a subject is exposed to SCP-472 more than 1 to 5 times. Subjects report visions of a massive growing collection of skinless, organic material resembling animal and human organs muscular structures, bones, though no recognizable bones, etc., joined together in a fashion that does not occur in nature. All subjects report multiple hearts beating within the biomass, sometimes dotting its surface. After the fifth exposure, all subjects report seeing this, whether or not previous hallucinations remain present or superimposed. Additionally, Interviews with multiple exposure subjects, data expunged, anomalous information element. See Interview 472-0165-B. Interview Log 472-0165-B. Interviewed Janice Erickson. Interviewer Pending unrelated evaluation, referred to as interviewer throughout log. Forward Interview held after recovery of SCP-472. Subject was part of household staff at the residence from which SCP-472 was recovered. Subject aware of SCP-472's existence and effects, but had to be informed that SCP-472 was specifically a garnet stone formerly located in <laughs> jewelry collection. Begin log. Interviewer. Tell us how you first became aware of the stone's properties. Janice Erickson, the stone, or what the stone does. Interviewer, the stone's properties, what it does. Janice Erickson, well I, all right, I'd always heard stories from people about how Manor was haunted, but you know, I never believed in ghosts or haunting or any of that tripe. I still don't, I guess. I don't really know what to, never mind. I wouldn't have taken the haunting stuff seriously anyway. Big old mansion with an old rich white dude who lives alone. Of course people are going to say it's haunted. People think everything's haunted. Subject pauses. Requests glass of water. Request approved. Janice Erickson. Anyway, I was right. The house was never haunted. It was just that room. Or I guess the stone. Interviewer. How did you first enter employment? Janice Erickson. One of my friends told me about the job posting. Mr. is kind of creepy, okay? But he paid. The job offer was like three times what you can get anywhere else. My friend Elizabeth got hired with me. My sister Maddie was supposed to apply too, but she had a friend who was one of Mr. B's old staff before he went and fired everyone the time before, and they warned her not to go. She tried to talk me out of it, but I'm a single mom, okay? You don't pass that kind of thing up. Interviewer. You said Mr. has previously fired all members of his household staff. Janice Erickson. Oh yeah, he did. I guess he did that every few months. 
just fired most of the new people. He only kept a couple people for longer than that, before me, but the last one of them died a few months after I was hired. Carla, her name was. Interviewer, what do you know about the cause of Carla's death? Subject pauses. Janice Erickson, I don't know. She was old. Maybe it had nothing to do with the, um, haunting. I don't know. Maybe she was just old. Anyway, Mr. hired me right away. I think he liked me. All the rest of the staff were new too, except for Carla. Interviewer. When did you first encounter the stone's effect? Janice Erickson. I didn't for a while. We were all assigned to clean different parts of the house. Carla wouldn't let us talk to each other in the house. Said Mr. didn't like it. But, you know, some of us talked outside of the house. They mentioned a creepy feeling about the third floor atrium. The atrium was where Mr. kept all his best things on display. There were hundreds of things in that room, you know? All these jewels and display cases and swords hanging on the walls. The whole room was kind of creepy, though. It had these big glazed windows and this big glass roof that Mr. kept totally covered up by black cloth. And there weren't many lights in there. You know, shadows everywhere. There was just no reason that room had to be so creepy. I think he made it that way because he was kind of a dick, actually. Never actually treated us like real people. I don't know. I'm sorry. What were we talking about? Interviewer. Your first exposure to the stone's effect. Janice Erickson. Oh, right. It was a month or two after I started working. Carla made me go find Marjorie, who'd been assigned to clean the atrium that week. As soon as I got into the room, I heard this sound in my head. Like, thump thump, thump thump. I couldn't tell if it was far away or coming from inside my head. I was pretty creeped out by that, but what was I gonna do? I told myself I was imagining it and went through the atrium to find Marjorie. I call for her, and she doesn't respond. The lights were all low, like I said, and the room was like a maze with all the display cases and old things with curtains over them. Finally, I find her slumped over in back of one of the display cases. She looks at me, but it's like she doesn't really see me. She keeps muttering something about blood on the walls, but I look around and everything seems normal. Creepy, but normal. I'm still hearing the thump thump noise, and it's going faster, and I realize it's my own heart. Subject pauses for breath and takes a drink of water. Interviewer, continue please. Janice Erickson. I dragged Marjorie out of there as fast as I could, and I felt fine after. I even felt a little silly. Marjorie got better after a while, said she just had a bad day and she was sorry and it wouldn't happen again. She was never a friend of mine, so I didn't ask her any questions about it. Subject pauses. Janice Erickson. After that, she took a week off from work. When she came back, she didn't want to go back to the atrium said it was a bad memory. Carla made her go back. Mr. W's orders, apparently. After like 30 minutes or so, we hear her just screaming, like she was being murdered. She came rushing down the stairs, babbling about seeing dead bodies, and they were looking at her, and she could see more blood on the walls, and she wasn't imagining it this time. Carla made her calm down and took her into a room and ordered us out. They spent a while in there. When they came out, Marjorie left without speaking to us. Carla told us she'd quit and was given severance pay. Later on, one of the other maids told us Marjorie was paid to keep her mouth shut and move away. Later on, we heard she killed herself. I don't know if that's true or not. Is it true? Do you know anything about that? Interviewer. I'm sorry. That is classified information. Please continue. Janice Erickson. Oh. Okay. Well, I don't know who was cleaning the atrium after that. Maybe nobody. I didn't really get on much with the other maids. None of them seemed to like me. A couple were friends with Elizabeth, and she kept telling me things about the third floor atrium. Her friends said they'd heard from other people that the atrium was haunted because of everyone Mr. killed to get all those valuable things on display in there. There was this creepy looking tapestry in there with skulls on it, African I think, covered one of the windows. Elizabeth and her friends were convinced this was haunted by the ghosts of some dead slaves or something. Interviewer. Where did they get that idea? Janice Erickson. I don't know. It was just something they heard. 
A month later, Elizabeth finally married her out-of-town fiancé and moved away to- After that, the other staff didn't talk to me. I never got assigned the atrium, but every so often I thought I heard the heartbeat when I got too close to that part of the third floor. Interviewer, you informed our agents that you'd had prolonged exposure to the stone yourself. How did that come about? Janice Erickson. Well, first off, I didn't know it was the stone. I thought it was the tapestry, or just the room. One day, Mr. went on one of his rampages. He did that now and then. Walked around the house yelling at all the maids and then going into empty rooms and yelling at no one. Then he fired everyone. Everyone except me, Carla, and some ridiculously young girl with big tits who worked in the kitchen. Interviewer. Why do you believe he didn't fire you? Janice Erickson. I don't know. I wish I knew. Maybe it was because none of the other staff talked to me. Maybe just coincidence. Subject pauses. Janice Erickson. I ended up taking on most of the other's duties. Then, Carla assigned me to clean the atrium. I wasn't happy about it, but I was now getting paid even more because I was doing so much more, and I didn't want to get dismissed. So, I go into the atrium again. Subject pauses again, takes another drink. Janice Erickson. And I heard my heart beating, of course. Again. I saw the tapestry with the skulls on it and I felt like they were watching me. I spent five minutes dusting in there and started freaking out. I thought maybe I'd end up like Marjorie, and I just ran out of the room. I felt better pretty quick, but I had to go in again, you know? Apparently, Carla hadn't been making anyone clean up in there since Marjorie left, so there was dust settled over everything. I didn't want to get fired, and I didn't want to quit, and I didn't want to make the stupid teenager in the kitchen's clean haunted room all by herself. So, I had to go back. Subject pauses. Janice Erickson. This happened a few times. I couldn't stay in there long without freaking out. Sometimes everything would turn red and I'd feel like I was suffocating. I'd hear whispers everywhere, though I couldn't understand what they were saying. I kept thinking they were the ghosts, noticing I was there, telling each other someone was here. I remembered Marjorie talking about blood on the walls and she'd only been in there half an hour. I couldn't stop looking at that goddamn skull tapestry. Eventually, I figured, well, Mr. doesn't even come in this room anymore. He's so old and sick and, really, if the tapestry was haunted by dead slaves, I'd be doing him a favor. It wasn't even that big and couldn't be worth that much, you know? So, one night, I... Subject pauses. Janice Erickson. You aren't going to tell him any of this, are you? Interviewer. That is extremely unlikely. Please continue. Janice Erickson. Like I said, I had no idea it was the stupid rock making all this happen. So I took the tapestry down. When I took it down, I saw blood on the walls behind it, and I really freaked out. I was just going to hide somewhere, but after seeing the blood, I took the goddamn thing out back and I burned it. It really stunk when it burned. When it was gone, I felt better. I stayed out of the atrium for a week, just in case. Subject pauses. Janice Erickson. When I went in there again, of course, I felt the heartbeat again. I was pissed. I told myself I was imagining things, and I felt really guilty about burning the tapestry. Like, guiltier than you can imagine. Guiltier than I'd ever been since I was a kid and accidentally killed my pet goldfish. I spaced out in the room and just kept cleaning and crying. Subject pauses, attempting to compose self. Janice Erickson. Then I heard far away screaming and I stopped dusting and saw the blood trickling slowly down the walls. My eyes were all blurry with tears and I tried to wipe them away and my hand came back bloody. I saw bodies, naked, dead, rotting things mostly half hidden behind display cases. There was this dead dog, and it was almost completely rotted and covered in maggots, but was still trying to move, and looked so horrible I couldn't even scream. I tried to run, I really did, but I couldn't make my legs move. I kept trying to yell for help, but I couldn't. I was so sure I was going to die. This lasted hours. I think I passed out and woke up a couple times. 
After a while, I saw this corpse standing around, staring at the walls. Then out of nowhere, he was staring at me. I think that was as close as I got to screaming because I really tried then. He never got close to me, but he kept staring. He'd disappear and then reappear somewhere else in the room, staring at me again. I saw others too, but they were on the other side of the room doing, I don't know, something horrible probably. And the blood never stopped leaking from the walls. Sometimes I thought I was covered in it. Sometimes it disappeared, and then it would come back with new corpses. The thumping and screaming from far away never stopped. Subject pauses. Janice Erickson. After a long, long time, the corpses kind of faded and the room stopped seeming so red. It felt like being half woken up. I realized I could move my legs again and I got out of that room as fast as I could. I'd spent a little over 12 hours in there, alone. Interviewer. Did you return? Janice Erickson. No, I never did. The next day I went directly to Carla and told her I quit. But she immediately offered me double the high salary I was already being paid. Said Mr. liked me, liked how quiet I was, and probably wouldn't be hiring anyone new for the next few weeks. I tried to tell her about the room and she clammed up and said something about fumes and that she'd look into it. I went home and held my daughter for a long time and thought about what kinds of jobs I could get somewhere else. But the money, it was just too good. I convinced myself that I must have inhaled something weird. Maybe some kind of delayed reaction from burning the tapestry. Or maybe that was the revenge from the tapestry for burning it. And everything would be fine now. So, I went back. I told Carla I'd take the offer if I didn't have to go in the atrium again. She wasn't really happy about it, but agreed. And you know what? Everything was fine for the next two and a half months. Interviewer. What happened after two and a half months? Janice Erickson. I was taking a nap on a couch on the second floor at the end of my shift before going home. I'd gotten comfortable, I guess. I was having anxious dreams and woke up to hear whispering. Familiar whispering, just like I'd heard in the atrium the other nights. I couldn't believe what was happening. I thought maybe I was still dreaming. Then the walls started bleeding, and I couldn't walk again. That's when they appeared. Subject pauses a long time. Interviewer, please continue. Who appeared? Subject appears to be fighting back tears. Janice Erickson, the corpse from before, staring at me. He was with my sister. She didn't look hurt, but there was something off about her. I was sure she was dead. And then they started talking to me. Interviewer, what did they say? Janice Erickson. They said I'd make it to the other side, that I only needed to take another step, and that I'd know everything. My sister kept repeating something. God looks on the heart. God looks on the heart. Then I felt like I was hallucinating or dreaming, and they kept disappearing, coming back, saying the same things. Then I kept seeing the corpse man from before, staring, and then laughing, saying, You don't mean anything. This doesn't mean anything. You are going to die, and nothing you are will matter. Then I saw him with Carla, and Carla looked half rotted. He was back to saying what he was saying before, how I only needed to take another step and I'd know everything, and trying to promise me something, but I couldn't make out what, over the thumping and screaming, which kept getting louder and louder. Carla didn't say anything, just looked at me with a blank face. She started mouthing something as the room got redder and redder. I'm bad at reading lips, but eventually I figured out what she was trying to say. It wants the foundation. Don't let them feed it. I don't. Interviewer. Wait. Repeat your last sentence. Janice Erickson. Carla was mouthing, it wants the foundation. Don't let them feed it. Interviewer. Do you know what she meant by that? Janice Erickson. I have no idea what any of them meant by any of that. Why? Interviewer. Disregard that. Proceed. Janice Erickson. Okay. Well, after that, I managed to make myself move, and I got the hell out of the house. By the time I got home, I felt okay, just really shaken. I called my sister and told her that I'd had a really bad dream. 
I really expected her to be dead, but she was perfectly fine, and she's still fine. But Carla, I found out that Carla was dead. They say she passed away in her sleep, in her quarters at Manor. So maybe that wasn't really my sister I saw, but it really was Carla? Maybe it killed her, or maybe she died and it took her soul, I guess, and then came after me. I just don't know. Mr. fell and ended up in the hospital the very next night. So, is that a coincidence? I don't know. Maybe he'll say something to you. He sure hasn't said anything to anyone else. And that's all, really. After that, you guys came along, so you know the rest better than me. Interviewer, thank you for your time, Miss Erickson. End log. Closing statement. Subject administered amnestics and released. Addendum 47278. Area of influence conditional increase. When no subjects have been exposed to SCP-472 for more than five minutes within a period of two months, its area of influence begins increasing by a rate of 0.5 meters, or 1.6 feet, per hour. Expansion is temporary, reverting back to the original 18 meters, or 60 feet, area of effect once a subject undergoes exposure. Addendum 472-130 possible physical biomass presence. Further testing with subjects exposed multiple times to SCP-472. Data expunged, indicating that the Garnet Stone classified as SCP-472 may in fact be the only visible portion of a much larger and continually increasing biomass, existing in so-called trans-dimensional data expunged, metaphor of the tip of the iceberg. Object class pending review. Additional containment measures pending review. Addendum 472-135. Subject biomass alteration. Data expunged. Subsequent testing of subjects exposed to SCP-472 indicates that all subjects experienced a 0.01 to 1.35% decrease in biomass with each exposure to SCP-472. Subjects remain unaware of this event. Containment procedures updated. Item number SCP-426 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures I am to be sealed in a chamber, with no windows through which I may be viewed. The door to my chamber must have a label completely unrelated to my designation or identity, in order to prevent unintended spread of my primary effect. Only level 3 and above personnel are to know of my presence, and particularly, of my properties. Assigned personnel are to be rotated out on a monthly basis to prevent contamination by my secondary effect. Psychiatric evaluation is mandatory at the end of the month. If personnel are deemed unaffected, they may be reassigned to me no less than four months after their last rotation with me. Any affected personnel are to be given a Class C amnestic and transferred to a different site. Description Hello, I am SCP-426. I must be introduced this way in order to prevent ambiguity. I am an ordinary toaster, able to toast bread when supplied with electricity. However, when any human being mentions me, they inadvertently refer to me in the first person. Despite all attempts, there is yet to be a way to speak or write about me in the third person. When in my continuous presence for over two months, individuals begin to identify themselves as a toaster. Unless forcibly restrained, these people will ultimately harm themselves in their attempts to emulate my standard functions. I was discovered in the home of the family after the gruesome deaths of three of its members. I had been given to the younger Mr. and Mrs. as a wedding gift. No card or any other identifying markings had been found on my box. Approximately two months after the family received me, fire crews were dispatched to the home due to an electrical fire. The younger Mrs. died from the electric discharge that she had caused when attempting to devour an electric socket. The other two victims had died shortly before the fire occurred. The elder Mrs. had gorged herself with nearly 10 kilograms of bread before her stomach burst, and she died of internal bleeding. The younger Mr. died of severe blood loss after attempting 
with me. The sole survivor was the elder Mr. who was suffering from severe malnutrition. He stated that he had inserted some bread a week prior and was still waiting for the toast to pop out. I was confiscated by the foundation after police noted my unusual properties. A Class C amnestic was administered to the affected officers. Experiment Log 426-1 Date Expunged Subject D-Class Personnel D-426-1 Procedure D-426-1 was asked to describe what he believed was contained in my chamber. He was not informed about my identity or properties. Details D-426-1 stated, I'm probably some huge monster holed up in there. That's what you guys have all over the place, right? D-426-1 remained oblivious to his use of the first person pronoun. Experiment Log 426-2 Date Expunged Subject D-Class Personnel D-426-2 Procedure 426-2 was placed in my chamber and given regular meals through a dispenser. No communication with D-426-2 was permitted. Multiple cameras were situated in the chamber, positioned so that I was outside of their field of vision, but allowing constant observation of D-426-2. We remained sealed until my secondary effect manifested in the subject. I was bolted to the floor so that I could not be moved into a camera's view. Details After 45 days of isolation, D-426-2 wrapped his arm around me and began conversing with me, stating that we were brothers. D-426-2 never deviated from using the first person plural when speaking with me. Subject was terminated one hour after this event. It is theorized that the isolation accelerated the progression of my secondary effect. Experiment Log 426-3 Date Expunged Subject D-Class Personnel D-426-3 Procedure A screw was removed from me and shown to D-426-3, who was asked to describe it. D-426-3 was not informed about my identity or properties. Details D-426-3 referred to it as my screw. Consistent with Experiment 426-1, the subject was oblivious of his use of the first person in his description. This suggests that, even if I were destroyed, my effects would still be inherent in my remains. Experiment Log 426-4 Date Expunged Subject D-Class Personnel D-426-4 Procedure D-426-4 was placed in isolation in a cell adjacent to my chamber to be observed until my secondary effect manifests. Details No effects appeared. D-426-4 was terminated 90 days after the start of the experiment. Thank God there are some limits to my effects. A lot of us were really starting to get worried about me. Dr. C. Item Number SCP-453 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-453 is to be staffed by no fewer than 4 Bartenders 6 Bouncers 4 Cleaners 1 Doctor 4 EMTs and two observation personnel, all trained Foundation staff, at all times. Additionally, ten or more Foundation security staff are to be kept on standby in the adjacent outbuilding 453-1, connected to SCP-453 by basement access. All staff are required to familiarize themselves with Document 453-1, complete list of known scripts, and memorize all scripts that have been flagged by the current on-site supervisor, Dr. Moriglione, failure to memorize flagged scripts is grounds for immediate discharge from SCP-453 duty and will result in a formal demerit on the offending personnel's record. SCP-453 is to be locked and guarded between the hours of 0400 and 2000 local time. From 2000 to 0400, it is to be unlocked and open. Anyone entering the club during operating hours will have a radio tracking tag clipped to his or her clothing 
and will remain monitored closely by closed-circuit cameras at all times. During the day, SCP-453 is to be inspected and measured in all dimensions by staff. Any movement of fixed objects in the building are to be recorded and reported to head researcher Dr. Moriglione. Fire prevention and violence suppression protocols are to be kept in accordance with Standing Order 405-991 Section T. Should movement of fixed internal structures violate this protocol, renovation crews are to be recruited to the site immediately for restructuring. Description SCP-453 is a nightclub located in Italy, currently owned and operated entirely by Foundation personnel. Every night, an apparently random assortment of civilians from and adjoining municipalities arrive at the club. Although the night invariably begins identically to any other club, over the course of the night, the civilians present fall into roles in one of currently documented sequences of events, termed scripts, by Foundation operatives working on SCP-453. Over the course of the evening, generally according to script, Civilians will depart the club and return home, maintaining only partial memories of the night. All surviving civilians depart before 0400 every night. SCP-453 has existed in its current location for as long as Foundation records exist. Archaeological evidence suggests a wealthy Roman senator, known for extravagant nightly parties, had a villa in the location as early as BCE. On several occasions, the building has been torn down or destroyed. Outdoor parties continue to persist nightly at the site. When the site itself is rendered inaccessible, civilian partygoers will gather as near as possible to the site and begin an impromptu street party. This party rapidly devolves into a riot. The club in its current configuration was designed and built entirely according to Foundation specifications. All core construction materials are SCP containment grade, to limit damage due to the more violent scripts. Dr. Moriglione has observed that the building has shown some self-mutational ability. Of particular note has been the gradual shift of the location of the secure locker containing suppression weaponry for staff use. It has moved closer and closer to the men's washroom. At this time, it remains in the secure staff section. Other sections of the building have slowly moved and changed in similar ways. A complete log of known scripts is attached as document 453-1. The selection of a script appears to be semi-random, although various stimuli will encourage particular scripts to occur. For example, script 117, the Silver Harlequins, has only been observed when more than 15 club attendees are over the age of 60. Please note that while script logs detail pertinent events, all events in the club aside from staff actions become scripted at around 2100 hours. Varies depending on script. Participants begin speaking in Latin while engaged in script, although music, dance styles, alcohol, etc. remain modern. Complete logs of all recorded actions, lines, and requests for each script are available on request from Dr. Moriglione. In its current configuration, SCP-453 has shown preference for three scripts in particular. These three account for roughly 80% of the scripts seen, and represent a good cross-section of the general types of scripts SCP-453 is capable of. These scripts follow, listed in order of frequency. Script 43, The Cheating Wife. Low priority, low fatality. Staff medical intervention required at 2307 hours for 43 males C and recommended for 43 males A and B. Medical treatment of 43 wife at 2319 hours is also recommended, but is conditional on consent from 43 wife, as she will have left the script at this point. Pertinent events. At 2149 hours, a female, 43 wife, between the ages of 20 and 25, will withdraw to the men's washroom, followed within two minutes by three males between the ages of 20 and 40. 43 male A, B, and C. Between 2152 and 2250 hours, data expunged. At 2255 hours, a male civilian, 43 husband, will enter SCP-453, order a bottle of red wine, 
and proceed immediately to the washroom. 43 husband will beat 43 male A and B to unconsciousness using the bottle. 43 male C will receive minor brain trauma. Prompt medical attention will allow 43 male C to recover within one week. 43 husband drags 43 wife out of the washroom and proceeds to data expunged, screaming epithets about infidelity and marriage in Latin. Other participants of the club pay no attention. 43 husband drags 43 wife out of SCP-453 at 2319 hours, at which point they leave the script, and 43 wife can be retrieved for medical intervention. Aftermath Despite the trauma of the events, 43 wife shows no memory of them the following day. When injuries are pointed out, she reacts with shock. 43 husband remembers the events vaguely, but will not believe they were anything but a nightmare. Reacts violently to interrogating agent if pressed in this manner. The 343 males remember getting in a bar fight, but not the cause. Notes None of the participants in this script have any relationship or prior knowledge of each other. If introduced after the events of the script, participants 43 wife and the 43 males will have an irrational hatred of 43 husband. This applies to anyone who has previously participated in the script as one of these roles, even on different dates. 43 husband finds himself extremely attracted to 43 wife. Further postscript introduction of 43 husband and 43 wife has been denied after data expunged. It is of some interest to note that despite capably handling the 43 males in combat, the script appears to preferentially select a 43 husband who is diminutive in stature and in poor physical condition, while the 43 males are typically large and physically fit. Experiment Log 453-S43 Deviation The male washroom is closed and locked after 43 wife enters. Result Four new individuals, 43 locksmiths, arrive at the washroom almost immediately after it is closed, forcibly opening the doors in order to use the facilities. Events proceed as usual with a 12-minute delay. These individuals appear to be able to circumvent any lock we have thus far applied to the door, including SCP- Deviation 43 Husband is denied access to a full bottle of alcohol, given a glass instead. Result 43 Husband takes a bar stool into the washroom. Participants 43 Wife and 43 Male A and C are killed instead of injured. Participant 43 male B suffers irrecoverable spinal injuries. Deviation Four Foundation personnel enter the men's washroom and attempt to subdue 43 husband using suppressive weaponry. Result Foundation personnel subdued by 43 husband, who reacts immediately to the arrival of the Foundation personnel before any attack is made, disarming them and destroying their weaponry after suppressing them with it. Foundation personnel ignored from this point onward. Script proceeds as usual, with a three-minute delay. Note: Direct intervention in scripted events should be handled much more carefully, in light of data expunged. We were very lucky this time. Dr. Moriglione Script 21 The Senator's Visit High Priority Medium Fatality Staff are to immediately prepare the triage room in 453.12 on commencement of this script at 22.13 hours. Medical intervention will commence at 22.59 hours. Most medical intervention will be aided by autopsy information from previous script occurrences, attached in document 453-S21-MED. Pertinent events At 22.13 hours, a civilian, 21 Senator, will arrive in SCP-453 accompanied by a retinue of 13 servants, 21 servant A through M. The servants will arrive carrying improvised weaponry. On arrival of 21 Senator, conversation in the club ceases for four minutes. Three civilians already present, 21 Assassin A and B, 21 Activist, withdraw to other corners of the club and confer with uninvolved civilians over the importance of 21 Senator's arrival. At 2217 hours, 21 Senator's retinue clears him a table near the center of the room, and he begins demanding extravagant food and drinks. The types of food and drink vary depending on currently available menu items. 
If insufficiently expensive menu items are available, 21 Senator will demand complicated dishes made from ingredients presently available in SCP-453. He has shown the ability to predict accurately exactly what ingredients and cooking methods are possible with the facilities on hand in SCP-453. Despite Foundation efforts to the contrary, 21 Senator's orders are always completed at 2227, 2239, and 2250 hours. This is one of only a few occasions where the script will directly alter the actions of Foundation staff on site. At 2240 hours, 21 activists will approach 21 Senator and begin heckling him regarding the treatment of slaves in a Roman city. Three minutes into her speech, 21 Servant A, B, and C will forcibly remove 21 Activist and assault her with their improvised weaponry. She will be left for dead at the side of the main club room at 2259 hours and should be taken to triage immediately. At 2321 hours, 21 Assassin A will approach 21 Senator, produce a bladed weapon, and attack him. 21 Servants C, D, E, and F will respond immediately, disabling and killing 21 Assassin A. No intervention has, as yet, been able to prevent this. At 2345 hours, 21 Assassin B will incite a bar fight in a gaggle of civilians along the easternmost wall of the club. Four minutes after starting the commotion, 21 Assassin B will stab 21 Servants A, B, D, F, J, K, and M, running rapidly through the brawl towards 21 Senator. 21 Servants B, F, and K can be immediately removed, as they will be on the edge of the escalating brawl and should be taken to triage immediately. 21 Servant A can be removed at 2356 hours, as the crowd moves away, but should be treated for trampling as well. 21 Servants D, J, and M will not be retrievable until 0010 hours and must receive immediate top priority attention or die. At 2350 hours, 21 Assassin B reaches 21 Senator and engages in combat with 21 Servant C. Both receive critical injuries as 21 Senator attempts to escape. 21 Assassin B finally disables 21 Servant C and charges at 21 Senator at 2353 hours, stabbing him in the neck. Any attempts to recover 21 Senator or 21 Servant C have met with further violence and casualties from 21 Assassin B and should not be attempted. From 2355 to 0115 hours, the bar brawl continues to escalate. A full list of injuries and possible civilian recovery times is attached in document 453-S21-MED, although no further fatal injuries will be experienced. At 0119 hours, 19 civilians, 21 Vigils A through S will enter SCP-453, all armed with improvised weapons and shields, and subdue the crowd using tactics believed to be consistent with Roman Vigils. The 21 Vigils will then clear out the club. Injured civilians can be recovered as they exit the club and will not exhibit any further scripted behavior. SCP-453 may be locked at 0200 hours following an instance of Script 21. All staff should immediately report to triage to aid medical staff. Aftermath No participants in Script 21 show any memory of the actual events. All remember being involved in a violent bar fight, and remember that some people were badly hurt. Other memories are fuzzy, consistent with serious intoxication. Notes This is one of the historically most common events, having occurred for as long as the Foundation has known about this site. It has diminished somewhat in frequency. As the most violent of the common scripted events, it is required that all SCP-453 staff be completely familiar with the exact sequence of all events in this script, both for their own safety and to diminish civilian casualties as much as possible. Experiment Log 453-S21 Special To date, any attempted intervention in Script 21 has resulted in either neutral results such as being unable to change the time required to prepare 21 Senators' meals, or SCP-453 staff becoming part of the scripted events, in which case the staff invariably suffers serious injuries. Further testing has been denied pending Level 4 authorization. Previous logs are available on request. Script 82 
The Plurality Cult Top Priority High Fatality If no known script has manifested by 0100 hours, staff are advised to prepare for the possibility of a Script 82 event. A weapons check is advised, followed by donning of riot gear and gas masks, treated to resist Type 14 neurotoxin. Civilians are to be told the riot gear is part of a theme night and issued non-functional decorative goggles if they wish to participate. Pertinent Events Script 82 will not manifest until 0200 hours. Until this time, SCP-453 will be fully inactive and events entirely mundane. At 0201 hours, one attendee, 82 Prime, will move to the center of the room and proclaim, in Latin, the time of plurality has come. Between 50 to 90 percent of the other civilians in the club, hereafter referred to as 82 cultists, will respond, we embrace the many. Note, any Foundation staff observed to reply in kind are to be terminated immediately and without hesitation by the nearest staff member. At this stage, Intervention 45382 Pariah is to commence. The following sequence of events is a summary of Pariah. SCP-453 staff must read and memorize the attached full protocol. At the selection of 82 Prime, staff observers will identify civilians who did not respond to 82 Prime's announcement, using software provided for this purpose. These civilians will be flagged on the HUDs of all Foundation personnel riot helmets. Priority 1 is to secure these civilians and remove them to Holding Area 45311. Holding Area 45311 is to be secured by no fewer than two armed personnel. Any 82 cultists approaching within 5 meters of Holding Area 45311 should be met with lethal force. Should the number of uninvolved civilians be too great to contain in Holding Area 45311 before 0215 hours, either due to space or staff restrictions, all Foundation personnel are ordered to cease attempting to contain civilians and instead begin subduing any and all 82 cultists. Non-lethal force is preferred. Cultists must be rendered unconscious or completely restrained, but lethal force is authorized and encouraged if Pariah is proceeding slower than anticipated. 82 Prime must not be harmed or interrupted in any way. Between 0201 and 0225 hours, 82 Prime will lead the 82 cultists in a Latin chant. They will not respond to attacks by Foundation staff, and unaffected civilians will act as though nothing is going on. At 0225 hours, if either, 1. All civilians have been contained, and or 2. All 82 cultists have been subdued, the script will end with 82 Prime laughing hysterically, toasting the club, and returning to normal. The rest of the evening will proceed as though SCP-453 were a mundane club, and all participants will dissipate before 0400 hours. If, by 0225 hours, cessation of chanting, there remain any civilians and 82 cultists, complete elimination of one or the other faction is sufficient prevention. In SCP-453, Pariah is to be immediately aborted and all staff are to engage all non-Foundation personnel inside SCP-453, civilians and 82 cultists, with the exception of 82 Prime, with maximum prejudice. Observation personnel are to trigger release of Type 14 neurotoxic gas into SCP-453. 82 Prime is, as previously, not to be attacked. Note that 82 Prime is proven resistant to Type 14 neurotoxic gas. No other gas types are authorized. If 82 Prime is harmed in any way, or if any civilians or 82 cultists remain active by 0230 hours, observation personnel are required to activate site self-destruct mechanisms immediately. If, by 0300 hours, contact with SCP-453 has been lost without registration of a successful self-destruct, Observational staff are required to notify all Foundation listening posts by transmission frequency Advise potential K-Class scenario. Aftermath No surviving participants will remember Script 82, remembering only a pleasant night at the club, even if Operation Pariah failed. 
with the exception of 82 Prime. Those who participated as 82 Prime will have recurring nightmares featuring data expunged, typically leading to loss of sleep, decreased productivity, and eventual insanity. For this reason, staff should capture former 82 Prime participants as they leave the club and remit them to site for therapy and monitoring. Notes Despite the severity of this script, Pariah is typically extremely effective. An abort has not been necessary since 19 and a full failure has not been observed since 1612-1857. However, reports indicate that Script 82 has become increasingly common since data expunged. Item Number SCP-468 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures a buffer area of 1 km is to be maintained around SCP-468-2. Individuals found inside upon initial Foundation acquisition may only exit with the permission of the overseeing Level 4 researcher. All Foundation personnel entering for purposes of observation must exit two hours after entrance. SCP-468-1 is not to be moved from SCP-468-2. It is to be contained within a standard locked containment unit. One video camera inside the unit is to monitor SCP-468-1's movement. The unlocking combination is held by the overseeing Level 4 researcher. Description: SCP-468-1 is an abacus with dimensions of 20 by 7 centimeters, in near-perfect condition, with no missing beads or signs of disrepair. Its beads despite the lack of any obvious motor or driving system, will move autonomously. Periods of movement are interspersed by periods of rest, which usually last three to five hours. SCP-4681's beads will often perform basic arithmetic operations, though this is not always the case. SCP-4682 is the former farming village of located in the Chinese province of Jiangsu with an area of about 2.3 square kilometers. It is presumed that the previous owner of SCP-4681 lived within this village. Research Site-133, which houses all personnel assigned to SCP-468, is located 3 kilometers from SCP-4682. Foundation investigations have data expunged. Roads, houses, and other sufficiently large man-made structures inside SCP-4682 will shift their positions as SCP-4681 itself moves. Movement invariably results in the formation of geometric patterns. Usually, roads lined with houses will move to form rows and columns. Other patterns that have been observed include basic circular and triangular patterns. Researchers have recorded a relation between arithmetical operations done by SCP-4681 and the movement of SCP-4682. For example, SCP-4681 moving to multiply 10 and 32 resulted in a 10 by 32 grid pattern with outlying houses forming a perimeter around the resultant grid. All sufficiently large animals, including horses, dogs, cats, and human beings, within SCP-4682 are subject to its effects. During periods of SCP-4681's rest, affected subjects will travel between structures. Only SCP-4682's roads will be used to travel. No two subjects will ever travel in different directions on the same road. The speed of travel is invariably 2.3 meters per second, with one pace taken every 0.6 seconds. Mathematical functions are often performed with affected subjects acting as counters. Animals susceptible to SCP-4682's effects begin to display symptoms 2.5 hours after entry into the village. The initial symptom is the loss of all complex mental functions, such as basic coordination, language skills, and reasoning. After three hours inside, instinctive and reflexive actions such as the fight-or-flight response, are forgotten. After 3.5 hours, brain activity reduces to an essentially comatose state, and only the knowledge of how to walk is retained. However, only a certain number of affected individuals actually take place in group movement at any given time. 
Because of this, surplus beings will simply data expunged. If enough subjects are removed from SCP-4682 such that the number of affected individuals inside is less than all movement will cease. It can only resume once members of the same species as the removed subjects are placed inside SCP-4682. Despite their inability to consume food or water, all subjects seem to be in perfect health. Removing SCP-4681 from SCP-4682 causes all activity within SCP-4682 to cease, though affected subjects do not regain lost mental capacity. Given the research opportunity that would be lost, this is prohibited. Addendum 468A Before it became the focus of Foundation attention, SCP-4682 was a relatively isolated community. Beginning January 12th, 19 residents reported roads and houses shifting several meters in sudden bursts. Local authorities assumed tectonic instability to be the cause of the moving structures and advised all residents to evacuate. Approximately half of the population complied. By February 3rd, no more reports were filed concerning the believed tectonic instability. By March 21st, Attempts to contact people living in the village were met with no response, prompting Foundation involvement. By the time nearby agents arrived, the entire remaining population had succumbed to SCP-4682's effects. A discrepancy exists between the population of SCP-4682 post-earthquake evacuation, 188, and the current human population, 66. Extensive Foundation exploration has not found a single member of the missing 122. Data expunged. Addendum 468b Patterns and calculations made by SCP-4682 have begun increasing in complexity since observation has begun. While only basic addition and subtraction were seen when first discovered, its repertoire of mathematical operations has expanded to include multiplication and division. Calculating the area of quadrilaterals, triangles, and circles, comparing proportions, and finding the square roots of two-digit numbers. On July 19th, 2000, SCP-4682 arranged in grid patterns used for basic arithmetic. However, Foundation observers quickly realized that the right half of SCP-4682 had only very limited activity whereas the left side exhibited an abnormal increase in subject movement. Dr. F, upon investigating the matter, theorized that the computations being made were an attempt to perform matrix multiplication, with the left-hand side acting as scratch work and the right-hand side including the actual matrices. After only 39 minutes, all subject movement ceased and SCP-4681 entered another period of movement the shortest recorded period of rest yet. Researcher estimates place the time required for matrix multiplication to take place inside SCP-4682 at approximately three days. Matrix multiplication was an unusual jump in the normally steady progression of mathematical complexity previously undergone. Furthermore, the subsequent arrangement of SCP-4682 facilitated fraction multiplication the only recorded instance of a decrease in mathematical complexity between rearrangement periods. Item Number SCP-438 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-438 is currently deployed in the field, in the custody of Reconnaissance Team Kappa-6. Experimental proposals will not be considered at this time. However, SCP-438-B may be available. Description SCP-438 is a white canvas straitjacket of the Posey brand, dating to about 1930, fitted with straps of an unknown material. The jacket is designed for versatility and will fit and securely restrain some 95% of adult humans when properly adjusted. The threshold for the effects of SCP-438 is unknown as are the precise extent of the effects. Research is based entirely upon self-reported personal experience and is therefore unreliable save in the most quantifiable circumstances. 
When SCP-438 is worn in a manner consistent with historical uses of straitjackets, the wearer falls into a comatose state, combined with a continuous out-of-body experience OBE. The subject's mind effectively becomes a disembodied consciousness. This form has no physical properties, cannot interact directly with the physical world, and cannot be measured or detected by any means available to us, including other SCP objects. However, even cursory tests prove that the state is quite real. The consciousness is actually separated from the body, able to traverse vast distances instantly and effortlessly, and retains a full range of sensory perception. Memory is comparable to what the subject would have in an unaltered state. During the coma, communication with the subject runs only one way, and is possible only insofar as his or her consciousness is actually present. The duration of the OBE is out of the subject's control, and the straitjacket must be removed for the patient to resume normal function. Leaving the jacket on for prolonged periods results in a reluctance or inability of the subject to return to his or her body. If the consciousness does not return, the subject will experience brain death. The duration at which 50% of subjects do not return to their bodies is roughly 81 minutes. It is unknown, and conveniently untestable, whether or not the consciousness persists after this point. SCP-438 has obvious applications in the field of espionage and scientific exploration, but carries considerable risk, both to the subject and to sensitive data on the part of the agency employing the item. It is fortunate that the subject must trust his or her comrades in order to use the item safely. If there is reason to suspect the subject's loyalty, the item may simply be left on until the subject has expired. Addendum 05. High Priority An item of identical form and function has been discovered and data expunged. Classified SCP-438-B, this provides irrefutable proof that SCP-438 is not a unique item. Considering the potential security risk involved, acquisition of any and all others should be pursued as a top priority. Orders from 052. Item Number SCP-425 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-425 is to be kept in a standard containment area, lined with a Faraday cage. Most staff with a security rating above level 2 are permitted to access SCP-425, the exception to this being staff who were born on days of the month that are multiples of 8 e.g. 8, 16, and 24. Staff who were born on these days have proven to be susceptible to the negative effects of SCP-425. Description SCP-425 appears to be a 1958 Philco Tandem Predicta television set. It was first reported in 1963 by the owner of the unit. Mrs. originally contacted the FBI regarding the SCP, stating that it had begun to behave erratically at certain times. She reported to the FBI that her son had begun having terrible nightmares and had scratched infinity equals eight on the left side panel of the television set. Mrs. further reported that although she had unplugged the set, it continued to broadcast without power at certain times during the day. Embedded Agent became aware of the situation and brought SCP-425 to the Foundation. SCP-425 was brought in and studied for six weeks by SCP staff, with no conclusive findings. It was initially classified as safe until 03-24-1963, when it turned on by itself and began broadcasting. Of the five staff that were in the room at the time, Four experienced a shared vision of what they described as infinity. They also reported hearing an atonal sound that seemed to come from the walls. These four staff members, while somewhat alarmed by the experience, felt a general sense of well-being. They described the feeling as knowing that there was something else out there beyond us. This description was repeated verbatim by these four staff members 
who were separated and interviewed immediately after the event. They were given no time to speak to each other prior to the interview. The fifth staff member, Subject Zero, provided a differing account of the experience. Subject Zero described a vision of moving extremely quickly through space to the event horizon of a black hole. The vision then took Subject Zero into and through the black hole, at which time he experienced a crushing sense of oblivion. Subject Zero also described an atonal noise, but reported hearing whispering beyond the noise. Subject Zero was not able to interpret the whispering, but was sure that it was not English, nor any other human language. Subject Zero was extremely shaken by this vision and the whispering, and reported recurring nightmares for weeks following the event. Extensive psychotherapy assisted Subject Zero to some degree, but he would report having nightmares at least once a month. He also reported that he no longer took comfort in the company of others, and felt lonely, even with groups of friends. SCP-425 was classified as Euclid at this juncture. Further study revealed that on the 8th, 16th, and 24th day of each month, SCP-425 broadcasts for a period of 8 minutes at some time in the evening, generally between 2000 and 2324. It will broadcast only once during this time. Early study by volunteer staff members resulted in mixed experience. Five staff were placed in the room containing SCP-425 and were asked to watch to see the results. It took fully six months of testing to determine that subjects who were born on the specified dates were susceptible to the negative experience stemming from SCP-425. Of the 23 subjects who experienced the Oblivion Vision, 17 had results mirroring those of Subject Zero, 4 requested reclassification and amnesia treatment, 1 left the site containing SCP-425 and was never seen again, and 1 reported no ill effects. At this point, SCP-425 was placed in a Faraday cage, and no staff member born on one of the above noted days has been permitted to access it. While in its enclosure, SCP-425 will turn itself on, but will not broadcast. It is assumed that the broadcasts are non-terrestrial in origin, but efforts to pinpoint the source of the transmission have proven fruitless. Addendum on 8-8-1971, a Foundation staff member had what was described as a grand mal seizure in the staff canteen. Medical scans showed that Mrs. R's brain had a massive lesion in the shape of a nonagon in her parietal lobe. She was otherwise fit, and there was no evidence as to how she suffered this injury. Mrs. R was placed under medical observation. On 8-16-1971, Mrs. began to speak in an unknown language for a period of eight minutes. When questioned, she was unable to explain why or what she had said. On 8-24-1971, Mrs. left her room in the medical wing, walked to the nearest blackboard, and drew an extensive and impressive astronomical map of an unknown region of space. After she completed the map, she collapsed to the floor and died. Autopsy results showed no biological reason for death, and study of her parietal lobe showed that the nonagonal lesion had ceased to exist. Item Number SCP-452 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-452 specimens are contained in a 5 meter by 5 meter isolation chamber at site Specimens should be fed live insects, preferably crickets or mealworms, but other harmless insects are viable, at least once a week, and regular observation should be maintained to ensure the health of the specimens. Personnel tasked with maintenance of SCP-452 should wear sealed suits at all times, while inside SCP-452's containment. Experimentation on SCP-452 may be performed with permission from at least one Level 4 personnel provided all safety requirements and regulations are observed. Specimens taken out of primary containment should be kept inside the specially prepared portable terrariums designated for safe use with SCP-452. 
Exposure of personnel to the effects of SCP-452 should only be performed in isolation chambers for easy recovery of SCP-452 specimens after exposure. Description SCP-452 is a colony of Latrodectus hesperus, the Western American Black Widow, physically indistinguishable from normal spiders of its kind. SCP-452 has a preference to spin webs near areas where humans sleep, and when allowed to freely roam, will attempt to relocate if no humans sleep near its web for extended periods of over a week. When a sleeping human subject within 5 meters of an SCP-452 web enters rapid eye movement, or REM sleep, SCP-452 suppresses the subject's ability to dream, even in subjects with chronic dreams and or nightmares. Subjects, upon waking, generally report having had restful sleep, though several subjects have also reported feeling unusual, like they are missing something. Furthermore, if a specimen used in this manner bites any human within approximately one week from the initial event, the bitten subject will suffer vivid hallucinations, in addition to the normal effects of spider venom. SCP-452 was recovered from following intercepted hospital reports of anomalous visions experienced by spider bite victims, after which a Foundation containment team was dispatched. Experiment Log 452-1 Date. Expunged. Source. D-21017. Female Caucasian. 29 years old. Subject. D-21020. Male Hispanic. 31 years old. Procedure. Specimen of SCP-452 in sealed terrarium placed near bed of source for one week, then subject exposed to specimen resulting in subject being bitten, anti-venom administered to mitigate physical effects. Details Source confirms no recollection of dreaming during the week, despite a history of recurring dreams. Subject immediately experienced vivid hallucinations for approximately 11 minutes. Upon returning to normal, described hallucinations with great detail. Source later questioned, and confirmed that the described hallucination matched the description of Source's recurring dream. Date Expunged Source D-21389 Male African American 48 years old Subject D-21395 Male Caucasian 26 years old Procedure Source selected due to known diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of combat experiences and data expunged. Subject confirmed to have no military experience or interest. Details Source confirms no recollection of dreaming during the week, despite previously having recurring nightmares. Upon being bitten, subject experiences vivid hallucinations and is restrained after beginning to scream and thrash. After returning to normal after approximately 14 minutes, subject describes hallucinations as being in a combat zone while data expunged. The bodies of data expunged. Several details given match that of standard combat procedures, as corroborated by source, which subject had no previous knowledge of. Item Number SCP-442 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-442 is to be kept away from its current owner in a secure container until being used for testing. The current owner must have a will leaving SCP-442 to a D-Class personnel. The owner is granted a suspension of termination. Should the D-Class listed in the current owner's will be terminated or otherwise invalidated for ownership of SCP-442, a new will is to be written at the next available opportunity. Description SCP-442 is a gold-plated pocket watch, 3 centimeters in diameter with hands showing the hour and minute. Along the edge of the watch an inscription reads, To my good friend, a helping hand. While no apparent seams allowing SCP-442 to be opened without damaging it have been found, Scans of the interior of SCP-442 have revealed nothing unusual in its workings. 
As long as SCP-442 is wound, it will set itself to the correct time. Crossing time zones or winding SCP-442 while it displays an incorrect time results in SCP-442 making rapid motions to adjust itself. The owner of SCP-442 is granted intrinsic knowledge of the time and can recite the precise time to an arbitrary precision as long as SCP-442 is on his or her person. Additionally, the owner of SCP-442 will never be late as long as the watch remains wound and on their person. Attempts to force the owner to be late have never succeeded while SCP-442 is wound. When SCP-442 is left unwound or removed from the owner's person, the owner will be incapable of being on time. The severity of incidents causing this increase as SCP-442 is left unattended, invariably becoming fatal within a week. Ownership of SCP-442 passes through normal means and can be sold or gifted to another party. SCP-442 has never been left unowned. Death of the previous owner results in SCP-442 instantly transferring to a new owner. A will, leaving SCP-442 to someone close to the previous owner upon their death, has never failed to surface. Attempts to prevent a will from coming into being have met with the same failures as attempts to make the owner of SCP-442 late. The new owner is instantly aware of the existence of SCP-442 and is drawn to it, although the effects of owning the watch only manifest after initial contact with SCP-442. SCP-442 was brought into Foundation control by J.S., a junior technician working at Site-19, when he inherited it as a family heirloom. S's superiors noticed an immediate change in work habits after he received SCP-442. S had a prior reputation for his lack of time management skills and was regularly written up for being late to his station. When questioned by Dr. J, S showed SCP-442 to Dr. J and said that it was a lucky charm. He then told Dr. J pieces of family lore attached to SCP-442, which later experimentation would reveal to be mostly true. Testing was performed to confirm SCP's status, after which its history of harmlessness was cited and S was allowed to maintain possession of SCP-442 on the condition he willed it to the Foundation on his death. S was subject to observation and regular psychological evaluation during his possession of SCP-442 during which further effects of SCP-442 were discovered. Extended ownership of SCP-442 slowly rewrites the subject's personality. Within two years, regardless of previous attitude, the owner exhibits unusually high self-control and reacts to situations in a timely manner. S's motor control increased dramatically during this period scoring in the 99th percentile of every test at the two-year mark. During this same time, the owner will become increasingly annoyed at tardiness. S broke ties with several friends over increasingly small infractions. After a decade of owning SCP-442, J.S. had completely changed. While S displayed a level of professionalism commendable of any member of the SCP staff, his private life had suffered tremendously. Unable to tolerate tardiness, S had pushed away all his friends and had been diagnosed with clinical depression. After S committed suicide, O5 reported ownership and had it transferred to him. A D-class personnel was then chosen for experimentation and given SCP-442. Item Number SCP-448 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-448 is to be kept in a 3 meter by 3 meter by 3 meter room, decorated with colorful wallpaper, warm lighting, and several small children's toys scattered about. When not under observation, object is to be kept on its pedestal at all times. Room must be kept clean and in good condition. All personnel entering the room, clearance level 2 and above, and only one at a time. For any reason, are reminded to smile and keep a cheerful disposition while in the presence of SCP-448. Description Object appears to be a child's jack-in-the-box toy. 
The box portion is 13 centimeters along each side and is constructed of tin, with a colorful decal depicting a smiling clown on each facet of the box, except for the bottom and right side, which holds the turn crank. When cranked, the toy plays Pop Goes the Weasel, causing the jack to leap out the top before the final five notes, as most toys of its kind normally do. The jack, however, transforms to reflect the mood of any person within three meters of the object. The strength of one's mood also affects its appearance, and every form it has taken has been unique. While the hand crank is functional, SCP-448 has been shown to randomly activate itself. Once out of the box, the jack will stay out of the box until the lid is closed, or the influencing person leaves the room. When approached by more than one person, object will stay shut and instead shake vigorously, becoming more and more violent until one or both persons leave its area of influence. In this state, SCP-448 cannot be opened, nor can it be activated, and can be dangerous the longer it stays in this state. Attempting to fake emotions, such as smiling when one is actually depressed, delays the self-activation of the artifact, but does not completely fool it. X-rays do not penetrate the box's surface. The following moods have been observed. Happy. Smiling Clown. While the clown's face, outfit, and color scheme are different every time, its mood is consistent. In this state during special events, such as holidays and birthdays, Object SCP-448 has been found to sing an appropriate song to the influencing person. Happy Birthday. We wish you a Merry Christmas. Here comes the bride. Take me out to the ball game. And American Pie have been recorded. SCP-448's voice has been described as high-pitched and irritating. Sad. Frowning Clown. Tears have been often recorded to flow from clown's eyes. Chemical analysis has found them to be of the same composition as human tears. When approached by persons with suicidal thoughts, object takes the form of data expunged. Angry. Data expunged. Scared. Unknown. In this state, lid will only open slightly before quickly shutting. Sounds of whimpering, screaming, and crying can be heard from within. Dog or animals. Anthropomorphic dog wearing clown outfit. When approached by any animal other than human, object will take the form of an anthropomorphic version of that same animal in clown garb. Emotionless. Blank white cloth doll. This occurs when the object is approached by an entity incapable of feeling emotion, such as data expunged. It is unknown if SCP-448's environment also affects whatever form it takes. Until further testing is performed, its current containment procedures will not be altered. Addendum. All attempts at physically penetrating or otherwise destroying SCP-448 have been unsuccessful. This is not because it is indestructible. Rather, when approached with the intent of dismantling, object will retaliate by opening up, without any cranking or music and relentlessly attacking the approaching person with what appears to be a red boxing glove on the end of a long, rigid metal spring. The glove itself has been recorded reaching speeds up to 235 kilometers per hour. Attempts to damage it from outside its area of influence with long-ranged weaponry results in data expunged. Item Number SCP-454 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-454 should be kept in a plastic bag with a thin piece of acid-free cardstock. This can then be contained with standard procedures and minimal security. There is no need for psychological containment. Description SCP-454 is a comic book titled The Crypt of Terror. The front cover has the picture of a female nervously looking around with a shadowy figure some distance behind her. The price is listed as 10 cents, and the issue number is 17. The item bears slight damage from age and normal wear. Although the cover mentions a werewolf, the story does not. Showing a subject a photograph of the item will not trigger an attempt to obtain it. 
It has no unusual physical or mental effects on subjects who have seen no more than pages of the interior. Such subjects experience a mild desire to read the item, but it is no greater than that provoked by any other interesting item. The interior story of the comic, as far as researchers are able to deduce, concerns a woman being stalked by a mysterious force. Julia, the protagonist, refers to the force only as him. Much of the story concerns Julia's efforts to escape him. She finally believes that she has bested it, only for it to data expunged. The first and last pages also bear a number of advertisements normal for 1950s era comics, which do not display the item's primary effect. If a subject who shows normal levels of empathy begins to read the comic, they will become more and more interested in it, expressing fear and relief as the story progresses, and finally horror when it ends. Subject's psychological state descends into excessive denial and depression as the story ends. After reading the comic, subjects begin to think and talk solely about a need to save Julia from him. If given time alone and appropriate materials, subjects write or draw continuations of the story in an effort to provide a continuation where Julia survives. Each of these efforts will end with Julia dead as before, however. In the event that a subject should make Julia survive, through deus ex machina or similar plot devices, they will throw away their effort, saying that it does not fit into the story. These efforts come to occupy a great deal of the subject's time and effort. Percent of subjects suffer from severe depression, becoming withdrawn and uncommunicative. Higher than normal rates of suicide have been observed. Interviews with subjects and study of notes left behind show a sense of helplessness and of having failed Julia. Subjects with a history of data expunged undergo an additional event. The subject will write themselves into the story, claiming to have found the perfect way to save Julia personally. Approximately percent of such subjects are subsequently found data expunged. Misogynistic or low empathy subjects display no psychological effect and show no interest in the comic or the characters after reading. Addendum. In a recent experiment, D-class personnel with normal levels of empathy were instructed to read the comic and placed in isolation. After multiple attempts, one subject claimed to have found a way to save Julia. He was found dead with data expunged. The security camera in his room suffered electrical disturbances during the event, in which a figure was seen briefly standing in the room. No signs of entry were seen. The security team was placed on probation. Item Number SCP-480 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Site 415 Located 142 kilometers south-southwest of Wyoming, United States Has been constructed at the location of SCP-480's recovery and is to be used exclusively for its containment. SCP-480 is to be monitored constantly for indicator signs of an impending fluctuation event. SCP-480 is contained in a Type 3 standard observation chamber, retrofitted with an early warning system consisting of a spectrum of electromagnetic radiation sensors. Workstations and research staff are to be situated a minimum distance of 25 meters from the observed center of SCP-480. In the event of a likely significant expansion of the area of SCP-480, a D-Class subject is to be immediately prepared and secured in the observation antechamber, located next to the primary containment unit. Addendum 28 Mike To address concerns raised by research staff, a memetic passphrase system has been instituted to confirm that personnel are not currently under the effects of SCP-480. All personnel completing a shift at Site 415 must undergo memetic reality confirmation protocols prior to being signed out. Description SCP-480 is a localized electromagnetic field generated by an unseen and as yet unknown source, capable of inducing substantial changes to human consciousness and physiology. Wall size and strength of the electromagnetic field fluctuate constantly. SCP-480 typically occupies a space of approximately 450 meters cubed, and usually is observed to be between 2.4 T and 4.6 T. 
SCP-480 is capable, however, of contracting and expanding substantially. It has been documented at minimums of 38.1 mu t and 18 meters cubed, and maximum values of 14.9 t and 792 meters cubed. Although SCP-480 is 62% more likely to experience a major fluctuation event if no sapient organism is present within its area of effect, these events can occur at any time, regardless of persons or materials present within SCP-480. When a sapient organism is introduced into the area of SCP-480, it will undergo radical changes in sensory perception and mental function. Subjects placed in SCP-480 experience a mental state similar to dreaming during REM sleep, and become mostly unresponsive to outside stimuli. In this state, subjects experience the perception of a recurring period of time, either a recent event or a time perceived to be in the near future. Each reoccurrence begins in the same manner. For instance, if a subject finds themselves driving a car upon a particular section of highway at the beginning of a recurrence, they will always find themselves engaging in the same activity in each successive iteration thereof. However, subsequent events will differ in each successive scenario experienced by the subject. Each recurrence experienced by those with an SCP-480 consists of an event or series of events that will cause heightened sensations of existential dread and or terror in the subject. Some recurrences end with the subject's perceived death while others conclude with the subject simply losing consciousness due to unknown means. Regardless of the means by which recurrences end, the scenario experienced by the subject restarts in the exact same manner. Subjects apparently do not retain any memory of previous recurrence iterations. Subjects will continue to experience the effects of SCP-480 as long as they remain within its area. Because of the nature of SCP-480's influence, Subjects exhibit acute, unremitting signs of increased stress levels while remaining within the electromagnetic field, invariably leading to deleterious physiological effects. Removal of affected individuals from SCP-480 has invariably resulted in spontaneous cerebral hemorrhaging in subjects, usually occurring in the brainstem, causing brain death within minutes. Addendum 481 Research Protocol Update 480-T.78 Modality of Test Subject Preparation In consultation with the Behavioral Psychology Office and Directorate of Neurology, the following protocols are to be observed for the preparation of SCP-480 potential test subjects. Note that a minimum of five fully prepared potential test subjects are to be maintained at Site-415. In addition to the standard D-Class incoming psychological profile, for test subjects routed to Site-415, a supplemental form, Form 480-T8, is to be filled out by the Sector Supervising Psychiatrist, detailing modified Legrand Unconscious Cognition scores, linguistic aptitude, and the results of a full phobia spectrum analysis. Upon arrival, all D-Class serving as potential test subjects must have vocal folds surgically disabled. Potential test subjects are to be enrolled in an intensive Morse code training course. All requests made by potential test subjects, e.g., food, water, any other necessities, will only be fulfilled after a correct request given in Morse code by tapping an index finger against any of the multiple purpose-built sensors throughout the holding facility. Test subjects will be required to maintain a record of their dreams, recorded in Morse code signals, a regimen of steadily increasing doses of psychotropic drugs is to be prescribed in order to facilitate a more varied and stimulating dream state, as supervised by the Site-415 physician. Concurrent to language and dream transcription regimens, potential subjects are additionally required to undergo mental conditioning designed to maintain self-awareness and conscious thought throughout the sleep cycle, especially during REM sleep. A test subject is deemed fully prepared when able to demonstrate the ability to communicate the events of the dream state they are experiencing through the established Morse code finger tap modality in 90% of attempted observations. Testing has determined that potential test subjects demonstrating this proficiency will have an approximate 75% success rate in communicating to researchers during an SCP-480 event. Senior Researcher E. Moore Addendum 482 
to all Site 415 staff. In regard to the procedural inquiry after Incident 48014 and the loss of Dr. Herrera, the Site 415 Ethics Committee has, by a vote of 4 to 3, adopted the staff recommendation that Foundation personnel affected by SCP-480 be maintained as test subjects for the duration of continued life function. While the effects of SCP-480 are undeniably distressing for those observing former co-workers, the correlation between presence of test subjects and reduced instances of containment breaches requires that personnel who would be lost to the Foundation, in any subsequent scenario, be employed to reduce risk to unaffected staff. For record-keeping purposes, personnel who are affected by SCP-480 are to be immediately considered deceased. Addendum 483 Recorded Results of SCP-480 Events Incident Incident 483 Subject D-84116 Description First scenario consists of subject describing being held in Site 415 per standard routine. No other personnel or test subjects are present in Site 415. Subject describes being stalked by an invisible presence, losing consciousness as cell door opens. Variations as recurrence occurs consistently feature an undescribed predatory presence and include subject being held directly in SCP-480's containment chamber, being held in a ventilation shaft, and being held in a lightless, presumably wooden box. Length of time before expiration of subject. Eight weeks, three days, four hours. Incident. Incident 485. Subject. D-06518 Description Initial scenario consists of D-06518 at Sector 18 Processing Center prior to assignment to Site-415. Instead of being transferred to Site-415, D-06518 is instead routed to an unrecognized facility. In each recurring scenario, subject is restrained and subjected to various surgical procedures. Documented instances include removal of facial epidermis, amputation of legs, removal of internal organs, and controlled application of caustic chemicals, all apparently done without anesthesia. Length of time before expiration of subject, 3 weeks, 1 day, 17 hours. Incident Incident 48011 Subject Researcher Riordan Description Unknown Length of time before expiration of subject 15 weeks 6 days 2 hours Incident Incident 48015 Subject D-39147 Description Subject describes being prepared to enter observation chamber in anticipation of SCP-480 fluctuation event. Each recurrence consists of waiting for a length of time for SCP-480 to encompass test subject, with research staff communicating to test subject that SCP-480 event is imminent. Time lengths for each recurrence estimated at 5 minutes, 45 minutes, 3 hours, and 2 days before communication ceases. Presumption is that each recurrence consisted of a longer waiting time prior to perceived SCP-480 event. Length of time before expiration of subject, 12 weeks, 5 days, 21 hours. Incident, Incident 48019. Subject, Researcher Moore. Description, Unknown. Length of time before expiration of subject, 31 weeks, 6 days, 17 hours. Item Number. SCP-475 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-475 is to be kept in a watertight containment locker in Storage Unit 45C of Site-36. All testing with para-religions requires permission from the Site Director. To prevent religious groups of interest from learning of the object's existence, knowledge of SCP-475 is to follow Level 3 Info Security Protocol. Description SCP-475 is an ornate sculpture of soap, depicting an unidentified pope. Inscribed at the base of the statue is the phrase, 
Cleanliness is next to godliness. Analysis reveals the object to be composed of long-chain saturated fatty acids, CH3 minus CH2N, totaling 89.7% of its mass, with the remaining 10.3% corresponding to attached as the hydrophilic head. It is believed that the gives SCP-475 its unique properties, but all attempts to recreate this compound have failed. When SCP-475 comes into contact with water and is applied to the skin, all accumulated foreign contaminants are removed. Tested materials include dead skin cells, perspiration, bodily parasites, mold, dirt, and detergents. Post-test examinations have shown that 100% of foreign contaminants are removed, a statistical anomaly. This process only occurs when used on human skin. All attempts so far to use SCP-475 on non-humans have failed to produce its anomalous effects. Testing on anomalous animals, such as SCP-1845 or SCP-2050, is pending approval. Unlike typical soaps, the usage of SCP-475 does not damage it. SCP-475's secondary anomalous effects manifest when it is used on a professing member of an organized religion. Subjects universally report greater mental clarity, showing greater adherence to church doctrine, and rate at least 15 centia kiva more on the Brandon Spencer piety scale. These effects increase in intensity the longer the subject uses the object, culminating in local reality changes, signified by all bodies of water within a 5 meter radius, turning into an equivalent liquid that is considered holy in the subject's religion. Examples of these changes can be found in Test Log 475. Addendum SCP-475 came under Foundation containment when insubordinate elements of the Horizon Initiative relinquished control of it. These elements cited a desire to maintain unity and prevent infighting as to why the object could not be kept. SCP-475 was allegedly recovered from the residence of the Catholic Cardinal who was found deceased from injuries consistent with upside-down crucifixion. The following materials were also provided. Access Memoirs of Access Granted I write this document to preserve the personal revelation invested in me. Over these past years, I have grappled with my faith. Having committed it to paper, the idea seems absurd. I, a leader of the faith, I, whose vote has determined the successor of Peter. I, who has undeniable proof of God's glory. The initiative, for all of its missteps and blasphemy, has provided undeniable proof of God's glory. Proof that has to be withheld from the world due to inscrutable agreements with occult forces who do not have salvation in mind. Despite this undeniable proof, I wrestled with fears that God is not almighty. How can a god so glorious and almighty stand by as false idols exert their forces over man? By the grace of God, my fears have been quelled. The night before, I beheld an apparition of Mary. To try to capture the glory of it would be futile, but it is an experience too magnificent to withhold. We were out at sea. Below the waves, I could see the church penitent, awaiting purification. Further below that, deep beneath, there was creation. All around us were the gilded statues of saints, each linked to a church far below us. The Virgin Mother herself was resplendent, situated atop a pedestal, the pedestal carried by a many-winged creature of fire. In her right arm, she held the Savior. In her left, a block of marble. She confided in me, told me of my purpose. Encased in the marble were the keys of heaven the church's magisterium itself, the authority to commune with saints. I was to take it, free the keys, and cleanse the church militant. Then, all will be made clear. When I woke up, there was a block of soap on my nightstand. Queer, but I do not question the machinations of God. Every day since that night has been hazy. I have worked with a fervor to accomplish this mission. Even to this moment, I have my doubts but I am human. It is in my nature to doubt. If there is one thing I can be certain of, it is that I am a cog in God's plan. Addendum 
SCP-475 approved for extensive testing with para-religions. Test Log 475 Note Due to the scarcity of para-religion adherents under Foundation control, SCP has been approved to create suitable test subjects. Test Subjects Religion Roman Catholicism Duration 3 minutes Results Water transmuted into a mixture of olive oil and balsam, consistent with the chrism oil employed in various Catholic rituals. Stigmata manifested in subject's hands. Notes Subject was heard reciting Confiteor as anomalous effects took place. The stigmata healed over the course of the next three days. Test subject's religion. Roman Catholicism, said a vacanist. Duration, five minutes. Results. Water transmuted into mixture of olive oil and balsam, consistent with the chrism oil employed in various Catholic rituals. No overt anomalous effects observed. Notes. Post-test interview indicated that the subject accepted the current pope as rightful Pontifex Maximus. Test subject's religion. Pentecostal. Duration. 11 minutes. Result. Water transmuted into pasteurized grape juice. Subject began exhibiting glossolalia. Subject displayed xenoglossy in the post-test interview. Notes. Subject made the following requests. Access to Site-36's sickbay. Access to any demonic entities housed on site. A pet snake. Requests denied. Test subject's religion. Hasidic Judaism. Duration. 60 minutes. Results. Testing was aborted after failure to produce anomalous results. Subject vehemently denied any change in behavior or mindset. Notes. Cant counters measured a percent increase in ambient Hume levels. Further testing warranted. Test subject's religion. Broken church. Duration. 13 minutes. Results. Water transmuted into machine oil. Subject began manifesting symptoms of SCP-217 infection. Notes. Subject was placed under quarantine. Within 48 hours, the SCP-217 infection present in its system had been rendered inert. Subject transferred to Site-234 for further study. Test subject's religion. Cogwork Orthodox. Duration. 14 minutes. Results. Water transmuted into machine oil. Subject proceeded to transform into metallic ovoid object, bearing numerous markings on the surface. Notes. Resultant object pending classification as an instance of SCP-1564. Test subject's religion. Maxwellism. Duration. 15 minutes. Results. Water transmuted into thermal adhesive. Testing terminated as subject began complaining about a splitting headache. Analysis indicates that part of subject's brain had been replaced with cybernetics, inconsistent with standard Maxwellist augments. Notes. Subject claims to have experienced a continuation of The Signal, a hallucinatory vision all Maxwellists experience after undergoing implantation of their first augments. In this vision, data expunged. Test subjects religion. Neo-sarcasism. Duration. 30 minutes. Results. Water transmuted into blood. Subject began morphing into an instance of SK biotype. Testing suspended and subject sedated. Upon resumption, subject calcified into a roughly ellipsoidal object and began emitting thermal radiation in the microwave range. Notes. Further testing with neosarchic cults suspended in order to prevent apotheosis events. Subject currently in secondary storage at Site 10. Test subjects religion. Children of the Scarlet King. Duration. 45 minutes. Results. Water transmuted into blood. Subject underwent a series of transformations, turning into progressively more advanced. In the Devite caste system, Variants of the DV biotype. Transformations culminated with the subject becoming a colossal squid, 
Masani Chotuthis, Hamiltoni, and expiring. Notes. Genetic testing indicates that the blood is from the common sperm whale, Physeter macrocephalus. Test subject's religion, Fifthism. Duration, 25 minutes. Results. Water transmuted into 100 specimens of the subphylum Asterozoa. Subject melted into candle wax. Notes. Suspected connections to SCP-1523. Test subject's religion. Church of the Second Hytoth. Duration. 30 minutes. Results. Water transmuted into blood. Subject's forehead developed pigmentation in the shape of a seven-pointed star. Subject displays previously unknown knowledge of Hytothan rituals and the language of Ortothan. Notes. Analysis indicates that the blood is from the common seven-arm octopus. Halifron Atlanticus. Test subject's religion. Children of the Torch. Duration. 17 minutes. Results. Water transmuted into an aqueous flame, similar to those created by SCP-2814. Subject then melted into a waxy substance, yet remained modal and cognizant. Notes. Subject expired after 24 hours. Remains stored on Site-23. Test subject's religion. Australian Church of Australia. Duration. One minute. Results. Data expunged. Note. Further testing with the Australian Church of Australia requires unanimous approval from the O5 Council. Research into preventing AU class end of the world scenarios deemed a class 11 priority. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.